Hello there, everyone, and welcome back to another episode of the Chief Librarian Podcast. I am your Chief Librarian, your host, Chris Morgan. Welcome back, everybody. It is episode 10. That is 10 more episodes than zero, and 10 seems like a really good milestone. I remember Carl from the Independent Characters used to have a joke, and the joke was whenever someone was like, I'm starting a 40K podcast, I want to come on your show so we can talk about it and you can steer some listeners my way. Now, the rule was, well, we'll see if you get to 10 episodes, then come and talk to me. Well, Carl, I'm at 10 episodes, and guess what? Your show's not going on anymore, so I guess that means I'm winning. I'm definitely not winning. You have way more content than I do, but I'll get there. So far as updates and hobby progress, we have some minor progress on the basement downstairs, in that we have some tape laid down, we have kind of a plan for what we're doing, and it seems that we'll likely get the basement done in the next six to nine months, I'm hoping. So that should be very nice. The Las Vegas Open happened, of course, and I was able to successfully do all of the judging things there. One of the cool bits of news that came out of that is that we are revamping the, basically the the rubric for how we're doing paint scoring, and I've been put in charge of that, so I'm sort of the de facto head paint judge. Take that, Salty John. Now there are two head judges, and I I bet you don't want my job. Ribbing aside, it was a very good time. It was so nice to see so many of my hobby. I I call you a hobby family right now. Uh, There's some personal reasons for that, but uh, let's just say that there's been a massive outreach uh, from several members of the community to assist me with some very personal stuff that's going on. And I don't want to bring the show down by talking about it, but I do have to take a moment to express just my complete overwhelming sense of gratitude and shock at the amount of, um, at the amount of support I've received. And uh, it will not be forgotten what an excellent community we have, everybody. And it was so excellent to be able to see everybody there at the Las Vegas Open who could make it. Now, I am having a little bit of a hardware issue. Some You may notice that some of my peas are popping a little bit more. I am trying to avoid that as much as possible. However, there's been some difficulty with that. I'm going to try and figure out which of my settings got screwed up so that that's now more of a problem than it used to be. But in the meantime, I'll be trying some speech tricks that I learned to try and mitigate that. I was also able to get my uh, table, my gaming table, and a few miniatures up to the new place and in an accessible area. So I'm hoping to get some more games in soon. And there have been some models you know, kind of trickling in here or there as I've been able to use some you know, gift vouchers and things that I've gotten from family over the holidays. I got the con. I'm very excited about the con. I have some uh, new horse heresy models. I have a Moritat. Well, I actually got a Moritat and a 30K or a Tech Marine, but they came sort of crushed, and I had to get new ones. And thankfully, Forge World's customer service was fantastic. They were able to send me two new blister packs to make up for the crushed bits. So I'm looking forward to getting my Moritat on a little bit more. I, of course, ordered a couple versions of the Dominion Zephon model because I'm an addict and I apologize for nothing. And once I work on that model, there's going to be a little bit of a review I do on the model and on the idea of making models of characters from books and the right and the wrong way to do it. I mean, I've, I've got a couple of the Black Library event miniatures. I, I bought the Eisenhorn one. I bought the Gotrick one, and now I've got Dominion Zephon, and I've got, I think, I think I got one of the Fafnir Rons as well, just because I think he's really cool. There was an interesting discussion on the model that I came across that basically talked about some of the ridiculous rules and things that have come out in support of these models, and some of the differences between the character as described and the character as executed in the model, and... I had a really interesting conversation with one of my 30K friends about it. He showed a video of a guy who was very salty about it. And I don't know if I want to do a response video, but I do want to kind of talk about the integration of characters from stories into the tabletop and the right and wrong ways to do that. 
But that is a discussion for another episode, I think. And the reason for that is I'm already kind of doing that with video games in today's show. So let's talk about what we will be talking about. For the first segment, I have a special interview with Adam. Adam, also known as Loopy, is one of the hosts of the Masters of the Forge podcast. He is a longtime podcasting buddy of mine. When I was on Forge the Narrative, we often had our shows mixed up because there was Masters of the Forge and there was Forge the Narrative and there was Masters of the Forge the Narrative. So that's been an interesting kind of running joke between us. Adam is definitely a pillar of the community, particularly the narrative gaming community. And I wanted to have him on and talk a little bit about one of the Donna Fire books, the first one called Avenging Sun. So in that segment, we're going to talk about the book a little bit. It is a spoiler review. We always do spoilers on this show. So if you haven't heard the show before and you don't like spoilers, here's your first of several spoiler warnings. But more than that, we talk about the idea of a new series that's supposed to basically fill the shoes of the Horus Heresy in the Black Library range. It's a very fun discussion. I had a great time interviewing him, and I'm really happy to be able to share that with you guys. So I hope that you enjoy it. For the second segment, it is a long one. It's about an hour and a half long, and it is all about video games and storytelling in the Warhammer 40k universe. Now, what I intended to do with this was was pick on Battle Sector a little bit for some of the good and some of the bad that it did. Now, Battle Sector is that Blood Angels versus Tyranids game that came out on Steam. And instead of just whining about it, I wanted to talk about it and kind of go into depth on the narrative and offer some suggestions, offer some like actual feedback to it. But I do get a little harsh in some areas, but I get a little happy in others. So expect that. I also talk about some of the storytelling wins in Warhammer 40k video games and discuss a little bit the philosophy of making a 40k video game, the balance between accessibility for new people and pleasing the existing audience. Now, this could lean into a very interesting discussion about why Dawn of War 3 failed, but I don't really talk about Dawn of War 3 that, that much this time. This is mostly about Battle Sector, and it's mostly about storytelling and bad characterizations, and it's about the, the things that you could do to solve that problem in a way that doesn't just horribly upset the fan base. So yeah, that is the second segment. I look forward to sharing it with all of you. And I am excited to get rolling. So let's jump right into that interview with Adam. And then we'll get into the video game storytelling discussion slash review. So get out your librarius cards and get ready to enter the doors of the library. Welcome back, everybody, to the Chief Librarian Podcast. In our first segment today, I have a special guest, Adam, a.k.a. Loopy, from Masters of the Forge. Adam, introduce yourself to everybody. Hola, this is Adam. Uh, I guess some folks might might have uh, heard, listened to my podcast in the past, Masters of the Forge. We do narrative play talk. Um, we recently changed our format a little bit, so we're doing... Um, every month we do one episode that's like a like a book topic or a or a lore topic or more more usually some kind of narrative play release like a codex uh crusade section or one of the campaign books but then we also do a narrative battle report where we play the game and we record something after each turn and we talk about our crusade forces and stuff so that's we've been around for about i don't know like oh, it's I think 2014 yeah yeah it's been a while it's been a minute i think i think forged the narrative came out a few months before we did but where it's like bastards of the forge that started getting confusing yes but it was yes. totally not intentional <laughs> no i can't tell you how many times like there were there were at least two or three times where someone would like recognize my voice and uh -huh. say, oh, it's Chris from Masters of the Forge. And I'd be like, <laughs> I've been on there before, and I love you for it, but 
not quite. Thank you. Um, so I don't want to take I don't want to take good credit for your work. Uh, but it was it was a funny thing while I was on Fortune Narrative and and we would talk and and go back and forth and you know people would mm-hmm. would get it confused and we would make jokes about it. Those those are good times, <laughs> treasured memories. I'll see on yours. Yeah, no, yeah, tr- much treasured memories. I also do some moderation for independent characters and I've I've run some tournaments in the past. Um, but I'm keep I'm keeping it chill now. I have a boy now, had a kid at 40, which is always a great idea. Mm. And we're just loving life. So, yeah, just engaging in the hobby in whatever way I can. Yeah, I feel that too. I'm I'm not 40. I'm getting there, but I'm not I'm not quite 40. <laughs> I, I have a new baby boy myself, so I've got a semi-grown boy and a, a baby boy and it's just two different sizes of awesome. I'm yeah, I, I living the dream. It. Absolutely. Well, I appreciate you coming on today. And we're what we're going to be doing is we're discussing the Dawn of Fire series. Most specifically, we'll be talking about the first book, Avenging Sun, and some of the things mm-hmm. that happen in there. But we'll also be talking a little bit about just kind of the implications of the series as well, putting in our own thoughts and opinions. Now, this is your spoiler warning, listeners. If you have not read the books and you don't want to know things that happen in the books, uh. I've got to tell you, this is probably the point where you need to stop and read it and Mm. then either move on to the next segment or do what you're going to do, because I like to talk about books, not around books. So we'll go ahead and do that. Even if even if even if we were going to try to talk around the book, I'd probably screw it up. So (laughs) that just saves me (laughs) some extra editing work, right? (laughs) That's always appreciated. Well, and I appreciate you co- for coming on to discuss oh, it yeah. with me. So let's let's jump right in. So just a brief introduction to Avenging Sun for those who don't know about it is the Avenging Sun is the first book of the Dawn of Fire series, which is their new term for a Horus Heresy style multi-book long series with a collaboration of different authors that's discussing specifically the events of the Indominus Crusade which is Gilliman's crusade after he arrives on Terra speaks to daddy and gets his <laughs> mandate to uh, reconquer the, the galaxy in humanity's name. And it is where he unleashes the dormant forces of the Primaris Marines upon the galaxy, just like games workshop unleashed them on our tabletops. So this is supposed to account for that entire crusade and mm. Donna fire Avenging Sun is where it starts. So, um, what before we get into like I'm I'm not going to do like a step by step in chapter one. This is what happened. Chapter uh-huh. two. This is what happened. I want to talk about some touchstones, but before we do that, like what was your kind of moment from that book? The book, you know, moment that made you think, ah, this is why I'm reading this. You know what? You know. It- Oh boy, that's a really great question. Um, which I guess that's why we're here. Uh, I absolutely loved the whole every part that had to do with an imperial weirdo. You know what I'm saying? Like, I am one of those people, Chris. I I couldn't wait for every for for the for the perspective shift to get back to the horrible underhive beneath the scriptorums. Oh yeah. Like all of those scenes were my jam. I love those scenes. Those are my favorite scenes in the book. I tell you, they, they really are. Are are you the opposite? Do you feel the opposite? Yes, mostly just because it's awesome. And and that's, and I appreciate your perspective on that because one of the things that you have to reinforce in a setting like Warhammer is just how awful everything is for everybody all the time. And the idea that there are like small gang wars going on over who can collect the right kind of vellum to burn in a forge or a furnace, like, and that there's, you know, these predatory 
uh, scriptorum workers who are looking for misfiled or mismanaged things and just excited oh, yeah. to get people burned alive. <laughs> and, and, and it's like those I'm, guys are awesome. The auditors, the yeah. auditors who go around looking for misfiled paperwork so that they can get a reward and the poor scriptorum worker who's who misfiled it gets probably servitored <laughs> yep or, or burned at the stake or or, or you know, whatever death penalty and somehow and he's <laughs> oh i i'll never forget that that phrase you know when so this character who we're following is trying to get this very important missive that she has sort of this spiritual moment about the emperor's tarot just kind of drops with these very portentous cards on its own on top of this particular notice that she's in the shape to, of the aquila yeah and she's she's like going through hades trying to to get this to where it needs to go and she comes at at, at a certain point she comes to a tunnel that's been dug out of vellum that's like fossilized together because that's how behind on the paperwork they are <laughs> and she falls asleep in this place and a dude shows up and and is one of these sort of auditors and he's get just, out of my house yeah this this <laughs> scrabbly miserable little creature who she convinces to help her and he's just so excited at how many times in his little you know just awful, terrible life, he's managed to get somebody sent to death for misfiling something. And he, um, you know, she, he, she motivates him by, by basically saying, you know, you're so proud, you don't want to be a bad scribum. And that's like his, his last words as he dies, is, is he's like, I wasn't a bad scribum. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> you know, like, uh, this is just, uh, this is so miserable. And of and course she gets to, like she that. gets to walk over the river where the emperor's, uh, effluence goes through. You know what I'm saying? Like mm -hmm. a literal poop river. It's disgusting. Yeah. She has to hold her nose or she'll die. Mm -hmm. Yeah. No, it's what a great, I, I love, I love, I love the under hive, uh, emperor's palace scenes. I, I think those are fun. What about you, dude? What was your kind of scene that you, uh, that you felt was the, why you're, why you're here, why you're reading this book? So for me, it was the unveiling of the, the Primaris Marines and that's, and, and everything that has to do with them waking up and starting to get integrated into the Imperium at large. Um, I don't, I don't know if you know this, but one of the things that I've been doing with the Primaris that I have in my army is I've been very carefully modifying them to look like they're using or at least taking themes from the old 30k Blood Angels Legion. And that, you know, from a modeling perspective, that's all bits and things. But from a lore perspective, like there's this obsession with what was lost, right? And so many of mm -hmm. these Primaris Marines are from thousands and thousands and thousands of years ago. Some of them yeah. are children who were taken either during or shortly after the heresy. Uh, and Correct. When I, when I think about them and sort of the jarring experience it would be for them to suddenly, not, not only just be put into active service finally, where the simulations that they've been repeating for to develop their muscle memory for thousands of years in non-combat situations finally gets put to the test. And then seeing how their dynamic with the original Marines plays off where you're seeing the original from the original Marines perspective is like, Oh, these guys, they're, they're fighting. I can see that they're fast. They're quick. They're big. They're strong. They're efficient, but they're mm -hmm. inexperienced. Right. Um, and then you have the Primaris who are looking at them like, you know, I don't really understand my relationship to you. You're supposed to teach me stuff. And then I'm supposed, I, I don't know what it is. Like I'm basically just yeah. following my directive because I've been brainwashed for thousands of years to, to do so. And then there's all of this suspicion about Belisarius call and what other directives he might've inserted into the Primaris in that time. Since it seems that nobody else was really, in on the secret right 
Uh, right. Except for Gilliman, who himself was night night. Yeah. Due to a, a small nick in his in his uh, jugular. Yep. A living case study on why you know on on the um, the benefits of life support, I suppose. <laughs> I don't know. Yeah, you know, yeah. Uh, that scene, I, I kept, I kept, I kept waiting for Belisarius' call to break into song, and all the all the Primaris Marines to be dancing in unit because they were fighting in unison. So it felt like a dance number to me. Mm-hmm. No, I personally, wouldn't, I wouldn't have been surprised <laughs> if he did break out into a dance number. And he probably would the have presentation, the showmanship himself. was just amazing. Actually, oh yeah. That's one of my favorite things to hate about him uh, is <laughs> that Belisarius Call loves Belisarius Call like nobody else. And he reminds me yes. of, of some of the most narcissistic people that I can, you know, I'm not going to bring real people into this. This is, this no. is, a, we're going to keep that out here, but there are a lot of people who How dare you love- dig into your guests like that. <laughs> 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 who just love them. I own it. I own it. It's okay. <laughs> but um, so far as, you know, Belisarius call goes, I've, I've read some of the other novels that Guy Haley has written that feature mm-hmm. call. And it, I find it interesting. You know, there's a, always this character who shows up. Cuvo 87 always shows up. I don't know if you've read like the great work where he, you know, call mm-hmm. basically uh, tricks a, a star God, uh, Catan and, uh, steals a bunch of Necron knowledge from him mm-hmm. and Cuvo did book. that. And then there's Cuvo makes an appearance in darkness in the blood. He's the one who brings the sort of the Primaris upgrade technology to the blood angels in there. And you learn a little bit about who Cuvo is, who he's based off of calls sort of, you know, best buddy. Yeah. Not his, his not sanctioned attachment to <laughs> something organic. We'll put it that way. <laughs> And I love watching Call work. I love watching him just kind of be so in love with himself. But the the thing that always gets me, too, is that, yeah, he's in love with himself, but he's also wildly competent. Like, yeah, there's and and there's there's something about those two things that makes someone so hateable that you just can't help but watch them but you always are kind of rooting for them finally to be humbled, finally to fail a little bit. And, and of course he never does. Um, yeah. We can't, we can't, we can't show him evidence of him not being awesome. Like he can't find any himself. So apparently it's, it's deserved, but man sure would be nice to see him get knocked down a peg or two. Mm-hmm. And it was quite the grand reveal because, and they never put like just the, the right, you know, exact number on the nut on how many primaris marines there were and it's a lot but it's it's in the hundreds of thousands i would i wouldn't be surprised if it was over a million and yeah. when when we consider the influence that a single space marine chapter has had in warhammer 40k because we knew that we knew the chapters and their potential well before we understood the legions and their potential now that was something that was developed in the horus heresy and the depictions of the Great Crusade and everything, the scale of the legions and everything. But well before we had that sort of written out for us to enjoy, there was the, you know, a squad of space marines can subdue a planet. You know, that was in the old codexes. And all of a sudden you've got like a million of, you know, space marines 2.0 with fresh, new, better equipment that's I mean, and it's new. It's not this this stuff that's been worn for thousands of years. This is brand new, like fresh off the rack mm-hmm. stuff. And you start thinking about like, okay, how how can he not just take the whole galaxy with this right now? That's- right. In the so the super the superlativeness of space marines is well documented. But at the same time, no, and and I think a lot of folks are a little put off by how much the Imperium has gained from the from all these Space Marines showing up, mm-hmm. and I get it. First, you know, obviously showing this series has shown how much infighting there is, and how I mean that this book alone has a lot of that in it, where all the a lot of the distrust is is shown even in more loyal 
brothers or more yeah. forgiving brothers. But yeah. later in the, as the series progresses and in other books too, you see uh, the difficulties that uh, firstborn have in accepting the, um, the primaris. I mean, gosh, have you read the uh, dark angels one? Uh, what's it called? The Gav Thorpe, not oh. Gav Thorpe, the Phil Kelly, Dark Angels one that came out recently. Oof. Oof. They don't treat that. their primaris very nicely. But I, I've read so you have I've, I've read ahead. the one that's about um Gabriel Seth and the Flesh Terrors and his Okay. You know, uh when the when the first primaris flesh terrors show up in front of Gabriel and uh uh-huh. you know, he basically does what Gabriel Seth does best, and that's I'm going to attack you. Uh not verbally, but physically to get to know you. <laughs> and that, that was, you know, that was not exactly a warm welcome, I would say, but I haven't, I haven't read the dark angels one. War of secrets. Okay. That's what it's called. That, and yeah, the they are not nice to their primaries. Oh boy. That's a brutal, that's a brutal book, but so you have internal issues with the primaries and also Imperium is so unbelievable. Like the galaxy is so unbelievably big. Like when we look at a map, if you cover a part of that map on the book with your, the tip of your pinky finger, that's thousands and thousands of stars that you're covering up with the tip of your pinky finger. So uh, for me, I, I do imagine that without the space Marines, I mean, I, it's pretty much it. Like it's the end. Now, I guess that's how they continue to tell the story where they're a little bit less spread out, but it's still, it's still a drop in the bucket. You, I mean, you can only, you can only play the loaves and fishes for so long before people start needing to, you know, do some farming. Mm. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> yeah. yeah, no, I feel that. And it, I think it's interesting that, you know, when you, when you make the comparison to, and Cole makes this comparison, he, he tries to act humble about it, but he talks about the Emperor's great work with the Space Marines. Mm-hmm. You know, and he, he talks about, as a way of not, uh, let's say, being egregiously sacrilegious, he's talking about, I was able to do this unbelievably awesome, immense work, this incredibly you know, f- amazing thing that no one else could have possibly done but it took me 10,000 years. And that's a testament to just how awesome the Omnissiah is because he did this, you know, on his own on Terra in a cave with a box of scraps, you know? Yeah. Uh, so he has, <laughs> that's this, right. He has this moment where he's like, what I did was unrepeatable and amazing, but the emperor did it better. I'm just saying that, you know, because I have to CYA a little bit here. So that <laughs> not everybody just goes, because everyone else in the mechanic was just furious at him for being this successful. And, you know, <laughs> you Man, invented red with jealousy. New? How dare yeah. you? I love, I love call. He, I love how he switches heads and hats and stuff. Like every once his, his, his personality changes a little bit with each type of mission he has to do Mm -hmm. it's really fascinating he is great but anyways i would love to download the most useful part of my personality when i went to work you know for that job and then offload it later that would be right i would say way less stupid stuff i don't know that i would but i (laughs) you know it would just be maybe you know more i guess topically relevant stupid stuff you know but (laughs) You know, that was kind of the moment for me in this book where I was like, all right, this is what I wanted to see. And this is this is kind of the stage that we didn't really get to see when 8th edition came out. So we, we've talked a little bit about yeah. that. There's there there are several different arcs and story beats in there. There's this uh, ultramarine uh, Primaris Marine who gets woken up and kind of gets his, you know, he gets his feet wet in combat and stuff. And he's being shown around by this. I believe he's a, a Gilliman descendant, you know, a, a an Ultramarine's descendant who was taken over as the, the personal guard for Gilliman. There's, yeah, white consoles, I think. I think it was. It was I one think of the all consoles. the consoles yeah. are Ultramarines. Pretty sure. And then there's the introduction of the, the custodies and their suspicion of Gilliman. And that's something mm-hmm. that, you know, you pick up 
along the series because the custodies yeah. have at least characters or arcs within each of these books to a certain extent. And you've got Yo, they're all ready to ace Rubute Gilliland. Like Oh yeah, the Tribune guy. If we gotta ace this guy, we will. Yeah. Yeah. When when <laughs> I when I get around to talking about Wolf Time, there's this uh-huh. beautiful line that I will have to read word for word. I don't have it prepared right now. But okay. there there is a there is a line where, you know, one guy who's kind of salty about not being selected to be a custodian when he was a baby because of politics. And he learns a little bit about the process. And I was like, well, who you are now wouldn't exist. But then he, yeah, think- you wouldn't be a person. Yeah. He thinks of some of the custodians that he's met and one in particular. And then he, he just kind of looks at it, this custodian he's speaking with. And he's like, so you're saying that so-and-so was designed to be an a-hole. And like <laughs> he made the custodian <laughs> laugh. And I thought that that was just a beautiful moment. Um, <laughs> Where it's uh, it was it was this humanizing moment for the custodians, and they are thankfully few and far between because you don't want yeah. to humanize those guys too much. But uh, the idea that this you know, remembrancer, for lack of a better term, this historian was able to make a custodian laugh is uh, <laughs> that was a special moment for me. But you know, you you have this tribune who is appointed to help Gilliman on the crusade. Specifically because, you know, the Captain General knows that this Tribune thinks that Gilliman's trying to usurp the throne. So he sends the guy who will cut Gilliman's head off before he does anything. As opposed to, you know, somebody who will just watch and watch and see. He sends the suspicious guy, which seems like the smart thing to do. Um, so let's let's now break away from the story a little bit. There's There's, of course, a MacGuffin at the end that they have to go and take care of. And it's a Chaos MacGuffin and... The world yeah, are but very the sad spaceship captain rules. Oh yes, spaceship captain, very good. You're not. She's wrong. hopped up on coke, but that's okay. Yeah, yeah. The, uh, you know, <laughs> it, one one of those like, yeah, I'm on shrooms, but I'm always right. You know, it's it's one of those kind of people. Uh, also, the sort of people who are you know very frustrated to watch succeed. But um, mm-hmm. no, she was she was a great character. That arc with the with the Inquisitor. Was, yeah. was nice as well. It's nice sometimes to have an inquisitor that's actually just you know actually what he is an inquisitor, who is not mm-hmm. just I'm secretly possessed by a demon or I'm really the bad guy inquisitor. <laughs> yeah, you know, the sort of I'm just story. I'm just a slightly s- slightly uh, uh, slightly naughty inquisitor who is actually here to try to help things. It's fine. Not everybody needs to be the exception to the rule to be interesting. Yeah, I'm I'm very I, I go hard on the Inquisitor and I absolutely don't um, I don't have any moral quandaries about doing what I feel is absolutely necessary. You know, he's still mm-hmm. very much that that sort of character who we would want in that kind of a role. Uh, but, you know, I enjoyed him quite a bit. But, you know, all of these side arcs aside, and I only mention them as an afterthought because these characters don't show up in the next novels, which I think is one of the, I would, I guess you would call it the greatest weaknesses of this particular series is that very few of the characters travel between the books. And that brings me to why I want to talk a little bit about your thoughts on the series itself. And like, what, what are some of the pitfalls? Let's, let's talk about what this is based off of. This is supposed to be the new Horus Heresy series, right? What are the pitfalls of the Horus Heresy series? What are the things that happened in that from a we're building a product for consumers perspective that didn't go right that Dawn of Fire could potentially repeat? What should it learn from the Horus Heresy? What do you think? I think, um, man, it's tough. I, I, I think that it's almost apples and oranges where Horus Heresy is a it's kind of a long space drama right where i think you're i think you'd be better off comparing it to the beast arises and there are definitely things it can learn from beast arises okay uh because you know i'm a big orc fan i love orcs and i love the i I like most of the authors who are working on beast arises i love david annandale i love Mm -hmm. uh gav thorpe and and I, it, it looks like, 
you know, we have, you know, we have Gavin here. We have uh, all these authors working on it simultaneously. And uh, I think I agree. I, I am missing some of the characters already. Beast Rises, I think, did something similar. Some of these characters ducked in and out, sometimes books apart. So I wouldn't I wouldn't say that some of these um non main characters won't ever come back but i think maybe they kind of belong to certain authors hmm. possibly uh the, like the big ones they have no choice but to write about uh like the custodes and the sure. and the remembrancers and or whatever they're calling themselves now Mm-hmm. And um, Gilliman and Call, like they have no choice but to write with write about them in in their voice. But I would expect some of these characters to come back, depending on who's writing them and and whatnot. Uh, I think I think that the Horus Heresy is too big. I don't think they can ever actually replace the Horus Heresy. Mm. I think. I think that's an era that everybody is interested in. I think it's an era that is kind of timeless and it's answering questions that I don't even think that the age of apostasy could compare with the kind of storytelling that you're getting out of the Horus heresy. Um, I think maybe it's due to the uh, incredible amount of dramatic irony involved in the Horus Heresy. We know how it ends. That's very interesting, right? And it's and it's such an old epic that I, I think trying to get it to be the Horus Heresy is a mistake. But at the same time, yes, I think I think they need to be uh, very deliberate about what what they're writing about and keep their storyline straight. And I think they're probably doing that. Like they have these big meetings about the Horus Heresy where all the authors get together and talk about it. I have no doubt that they've been on Zoom or or whatever uh, talking about who's doing what and where this storyline is going. At least I hope so. I think that's I think that's the important thing. You know, the 12 years not 112 anymore, but 12 years Ooh. between um, when the Primaris are revealed and when, well, yeah, when the Primaris are revealed and when, then the events of the uh, Plague War are probably going to be covered in all of these books. And I am not sure how many books that is. I, I, I expect it to end. I don't, I don't expect it to go on forever. This is a very specific time period. Like you said, it's kind of a prequel. I, I expect it to end. And I, I, I would hesitate to say that we would get a lot more, um, Indomitus era books after maybe the next edition of Warhammer's released. Hmm. Interesting. Cause from what mm-hmm. I understand from their pu- from their like publicity, from their hype train that right. you know, Warhammer community is always writing that this was supposed to be the the big one, you know, the big right. new series because Siege of Terra is coming to an end. We have two books left in that series before the the big the big boom. You know, that's it. That's yep. everything. That story's over. And I, I think that there are some some key differences here. The the thing about the Horus Heresy, and you touched on this, is that it is a tragedy. It is, and it is a an example of how it's not about the destination; it's about the journey. You know that yeah. that that is what the Horus Heresy series is. And to the extent that we know that the Indominus Crusade does X Y Z things, because we've read codexes and we've you know read some mm-hmm. of the the Plague War stuff, but even more than that, the overall message of the Indominus Crusade is a hopeful one where the Horus heresy is a depressing one and it's a, it's a tragic one. So there's still this sort of open-ended, everything is terrible, but there is the light of hope. You know, that's, that's what Indominus is trying to do. And I feel like that is one of the weaknesses of the potential of this series. Like it's one of the pitfalls that they can get into. I mean, obviously there's 
there's risks of in one of one of the more criticized like Horus Heresy books, for example, uh, Damnation of Pythos. That's it's it's like a little Lovecraftian snippet like story built into the Horus Heresy series. And when it came out, it was this whole book, and it was very small scale. It was very localized. Mm-hmm. We didn't really understand how it tied into the entirety of the Horus Heresy. And didn't find out until much later when you're reading Ruin Storm exactly how the effect you know the events of that book would tie into what what allowed you know Gilliman, Sanguinius, and the Lion to get through and you know destroy Davin to open up the you know the Horus Heresy equivalent of the Cicatrix Maledictum, you know, the aforementioned Ruin Storm to mm-hmm. get over to Terra. Like you didn't really understand the implications of that, and it left people who were excited for the next release a little disappointed because, yes, it was this cool sort of experiment in the setting, but you had to kind of figure out after the fact, many, 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 many books later, exactly why this mattered. And I worry that they're going to get carried away like that with this in, you know, Dawn of Fire series as well. Because there's a lot of potential for that. And yet, the, you you said it yourself, the galaxy is a huge place. There's any number of stories you could tell in this setting. Just like, the, you know, even after the Siege of, Terror, Siege of Terror is over, there are probably a hundred new books that they could easily just write in the setting that were somewhere involving some conflict between some of the legions that just weren't part of the main drive, you know? Um, mm-hmm that doesn't necessarily mean that they'll be compelling. And no. one of the things that I don't like about how few of the characters transfer between the series is we, we need that thread to connect us. And Gilliman isn't a big enough thread to connect every single book by himself. It is cool to, it is always cool to see a prime market work. Like it is always cool. There's never been a book where I've been reading it and I've thought, you know, this book needs less Primark in it, except maybe if it's like Fulgrim, uh, Fulgrim, right. he can be a lot sometimes, uh, great for parties, but a little goes a long way. Um, but so far as, you know, Gilliman himself, even his roles in these books are usually very, very trim and slim. And he is usually not the focus. He'll have yeah. a scene or two in a chapter. He's not the character who is driving everything. And he is very primarchy in his primarchness. Don't get me wrong. Uh, but one of the, the things that's a problem with a character like Gilliman in the setting right now is that he doesn't really have anybody to, anybody within the Imperium to contend with as an equal. You know, there's, there's no, what would you call it, no foil that's good enough for him right now. Not even among the custodies. So he he can't carry it, but these side characters who are bouncing in and out of these series, they can't carry it much either. No, and and Call, they they try to do it with Call a little bit. It does seem it does seem like there's no single source of truth, which honestly, you know, one might argue is a good thing. You're you're left to your own devices who you which source of truth you, you identify with best. Um, and you're loath. I'm sure Game, Games Workshop Black Library and the writers are loath to answer questions directly. Um, is I, I wonder if if this Indomitus series is a little too soon. Um, I really think that. You know, we're taking this into a much wider discussion, and I apologize if it's <laughs> if it's um expanding it too much, but I personally see Black Library's future with 40k being tied to the division between Imperium Sanctus and Imperium Nihilus, and sure. and the uh, and the forces of chaos and the forces of the Imperium and and how they clash. And I could definitely see a character if only. If only Aaron Dembski Bowden could write faster, you know, but you can't rush greatness. Uh, you know, Abaddon makes a much better source of truth than anyone else in Warhammer. 
because even though his perspective is warped just like anybody else, um, he's lucid as hell, right? (laughs) He is lucid and he has a long memory. And I think a ultimate confrontation between Gilliman and um, Abaddon is inevitable. But where do you play that? Where do you set that in motion? Uh, I honestly, you know, they Black Library kind of set up the Gilliman versus Mortarion thing as as epic, and it is epic. It is epic, but it's not. Mortarion is not the guy anymore. It's no. Abaddon. No, and I can see Abaddon placing himself kind. Of, I've always so here I am I'm kind of rambling from topic to topic, but there is a. A crystal throne in uh, the Ghoul Stars that's uh, watched over by. Hold on, I just, I just, I just quickly searched for it. <laughs> it's um, it's overseen by the Death Specters. Yes, yeah. And I'm wondering if he can wrap some, maybe, maybe put poor Mortarion in there or something, and use. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> Okay. Yeah. <laughs> and kind of it kind of have some kind of interesting dichotomy there. I mean, I know that in the past the that chaos used um the eye of terror as their as their beacon sometimes, right? But now we have now we have the rift and everything like that. I think that that's a really good I think we need to focus more on that. More on um the the chaos space marines and their the the former legions and how they interact with Mortarion and and Mortarion butting heads with Gilliman and I think that would create a compelling st- overall story. Yeah, well, I mean, I think that chaos as the main antagonist, the goal of that for Eighth Edition was a, a good one, because really chaos is the big bad. Yes. Um, that being said, uh, hold on, that was the beeper for dinner. I'm gonna. I'm going to pause this real fast. I'll yeah. be right back. I just got to take it out. But yeah, chaos as the antagonist is kind of gotten lost in the latest edition of Warhammer. And the, the story needs to pivot back in that kind of a direction. But they also may be afraid to do so because they know that setting up that kind of final confrontation usually means that there's some kind of catalyst for change. I mean, that's what happened with the yeah. Polycadia, right? It's like something had yeah. to happen when Kadia yeah. fell. By keeping it minutes to midnight forever, you can drag it out. And you don't want to accelerate these things too fast in a world that you've created, well, a world, a galaxy that you've created that has such ponderous, lethargic momentum. I re- I think that there does need to be an epic confrontation uh, over the Nachman gauntlet. And I think, I think it would be great if uh, one of the great authors did do a, a Abaddon story arc in Imperium Noctis, getting everything together, pulling them together for a big fight. And that's where you start losing Primaris. That's where things start shifting back towards the darkness. And I think, I think Gilliman has to die for that to happen. Hmm. Uh, I I doubt that Gilliman is going to die anytime soon. Uh, Just like I doubt that we're actually going to see a new loyalist Primark in, in (laughs) and it's, it's one of those things was like, there's, there's clearly a bias towards the chaos side of, of Primarchs uh, so far as returning. And I, I definitely believe that Gilliman will be on his own for quite some time. I mean, mm-hmm. if they were going to do a, you know, a sort of split Imperium, a government sort of thing, or an antagonist for Gilliman within the Imperium, they wouldn't have made Dante in charge of Imperium Nihilus. And that's, I, I could go on about what I hope to see from the blood angels, but that's not what this show is about. Uh, oh, you mean like where all the firstborn sacrifice themselves to resurrect the sanguineous? I have theories, but we'll, we'll talk about <laughs> those later. Uh, the, in, in, uh, mm, mm, just wait till I get to that. Why I love blood angels episode. You guys are not prepared for that. 
Uh, <laughs> but the, I, I guess as, as we're trying to wrap this up and, you know, talking about Abaddon as an antagonist, I do want to point out one thing that you mentioned so far as, you know, Aaron Dembski Bowden and his authorship and his kind of custodianship, we'll say, of Abaddon as a character. And in chaos in general, too. To a, to a certain extent, like they basically, yeah, they all right, take this caricature of flaws and make it dynamic. Like that's what they do. Yeah. They did that with the word bearers. They did that with the world eaters. I'm glad I didn't mix those two up as I said them and did that with the night Lords. And he's been doing that with the black Legion because somebody at games workshop finally got the message that everybody thinks that Abaddon is a joke. And he made, he, he made me feel empathy for the night Lords and I hate him for it. And I love him for it, especially because he turns it. I don't want to give away too much, but he really does turn it right around and be like, and he, he communicates you, wait, no, no, it's okay to, to, to hate these people mm -hmm. despite they, your empathy. They're super. And hateable. it's just oh, so good at it. Yep. Well, so far as Abaddon goes though, in that series, in the night mm -hmm. series, the first time, I read that was after I'd already read you know, Talon of Horus. Mm -hmm. It was before Black Legion had come out. So I read Talon of, Hor Talon of Horus and, and Abaddon in there was like enigmatic and mysterious. But in the Night Lords trilogy, he was like Saturday morning cartoon villain. Mm -hmm. he, was, he was very different characters. And I've always kind of observed that. Um, the difference between the two. And you know, wondered how how we can make Abaddon back to back to the focus, and you know that's I guess since we've gotten so far off of uh, Dawn of Fire, we should probably <laughs> wrap it up there. Uh, that being said, I do appreciate you coming on to to talk about it. I am very interested in what the listeners think about the new series and where it's going and how you know what is keeping you invested what is keeping you from getting invested like i'd love to hear from mm -hmm. anybody listening about that and we'll be doing a another conversation uh, uh, about the second book gate of bones i believe is what it's called right. and talking a little bit about the implications of that book and then wolf time will be tied into the why i love space wolves episode which is coming up <laughs> in the next hey in, one or two can months. i say something mm. uh well i so, Gate of Bones, easy read. Wolf, if you're on Wolf Time, get through the first quarter. Slog through it, guys and gals. Just, just, just get it done. Mm -hmm. Eat your vegetables because there's a heaping helping of meat and potatoes at the in the last two thirds. And cake. There's also cake. There's cake. Yes, you're so absolutely much. right. There's definitely cake. Such wolfy cake. But uh, <laughs> yeah, I. I will say that uh, I, I I very much enjoyed the latter half of Wolf Time more than the former half, and it's so good. We can we'll we'll, we'll get there. We'll talk about it. Don't worry, dude. I hate Space Wolves. I think they're <laughs> stupid, and I love that book. I loved that book. Oh man, so. who you just made some enemies, but that's what we're here for. <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, uh, thank you again, Adam, for joining me yeah. to talk about Dawn of Fire. And Thanks for hopefully inviting me. we'll have another opportunity to talk soon about yeah. this or other things. Um, mm -hmm. And I hope someday that we get to roll dice together. We're on like semi opposite sides of the country. Yeah. I would love an opportunity to roll dice with you sometime. Maybe Adepticon 2023. Fingers crossed, man. Hope life <laughs> settles down by then. But yeah, we'll wrap it up there. Thank you again. Thanks everybody for listening. Peace out. Stay tuned for the hour and a half long rant that I have about storytelling and video games that will shortly follow the segment. <laughs> Cheers. Hey, hey, tough luck tonight, buddy. Yeah, tough new hotness, more like it. Uh, sure, pal. Same time next week? Sure. See ya. <sighs> What am I going to do about the new hotness? Commando, we need to talk. Ah, Cato Sicarius. No, it is I, Robute Gilliman, 
and we need to talk about your performance tonight. Aw, oh, come on, Rabute. He's playing the new hotness. What can I do? Well, the Codex says to use the terrain to your advantage, not leaving your whole army set up in the open. But, Rabute, the best I can do is this packing styrofoam that came with my dad's TV. Heresy! You can do better than that. Buy some MDF terrain from Frontline Gaming. Frontline Gaming? Isn't that that company run by the guy who sounds like he has strep throat all the time? Hey, bro, not cool. Silence! Don't get distracted. This is how you forgot to bring in your reserves. But, Rabute, I don't even know what MDF means. It's woodcut with last guns or something. It's not important. It's quality, durable terrain made for all modes of play with different themes like desert, ruined city, industrial, aliens, and more. But I hate painting terrain. It's boring. Never fear. Frontline Gaming has painting services as well. You're right, Lord Gilliman. I should order some. But how do I do that? Where do I start? Go to www. FrontlineGaming.org to find out more about terrain, miniatures, painting services, hobby articles, and events. Gee, thanks, Rabute. Any more advice for your loyal force commander? Not now, commander. I have to go back and check on Marnius. Last time I was gone this long, the 500 worlds became the 375. Go ahead and check out www.FrontlineGaming.org. Tell the Chief Librarian sent you. Hello and welcome back to the Chief Librarian podcast. And for this segment, we are going to talk a little bit about storytelling in Warhammer video games. Now, this is a bit of an interesting subject just because when we're thinking of a Warhammer 40k video game, when we're thinking about video games in general, there are some very clear winners in terms of story in the history of video games, but there hasn't really been anything in video gaming yet that just knocked our socks off from a Warhammer 40k perspective. But we are seeing more and more mainstream gaming when it comes to Warhammer stuff. I mean, I think the most notable recent example would be the Total War games, and that's probably one of the best examples of a Warhammer adaptation into a video game, in my opinion. But of course, this is my podcast, so it's going to be full of my opinion. So let's just take that for granted for the rest of this discussion as we think about a little bit what narrative storytelling in video games has been and what it could be. Now, if I were to, off the top of my head, rank the the best Warhammer themed video games I'd ever played, I'd probably put Total War Warhammer 2 at the top of that list. I haven't played 3 yet, so going to hold off on that. And I would probably put Dawn of War 2 right after that, and then Space Marine. And when I'm talking about Dawn of War 2, by the way, I want to talk about the entirety of Dawn of War 2. So that includes all of the expansions. And I think that that is probably the most interesting example here in terms of a, a Warhammer 40k game that tried its best to be both an RPG and an RTS. But if I had to pick a storytelling ranking, I would probably put Dawn of War 2 first, Space Marine second, and then Total War, Warhammer 1 and 2 at third. Or maybe not even on the list, because let's be real, there isn't a whole lot of, of storytelling when it comes to the Total War games. A lot of it is just gaming and army, army management That's in that sense, and it does that excellently. I don't think the Total War maybe should even be on that list, because it's not really trying to be the storytelling, but it is at the very least worth mentioning, I think, because they took so much care into representing the world as it had been established extremely well. And I think that some credit is due to them for that. But of course, there have been tons of other Warhammer themed video games, right from mobile games all the way up to console and PC games. Of course, Dawn of War 1 and 3 exist, and yes, 3 exists. I know someone's groaning right now, but 3 existed. It, it was, is a thing. And there's a ton of, of Space Wolf themed, like there was, a, there was a Space Wolf themed like mobile card game that's also out on PC. There's the Horus Heresy Legions game, which is like a, it's like a Hearthstone for 30k. I actually enjoy that one quite a bit. No story involved in that, of course. It's, it's a card game. 
well, to a, to a certain extent. Uh, this year, they've started releasing these little campaigns where you play through a, a series of narratives based on some of the collectible warlords, and they have pre-recorded voice lines. But it's really just a pretense for if you play through this series of escalating challenges in this card game, then you're going to unlock a special card back or get, you know, get some in-game currency or whatever it may be. It's not really writing that they've done either. It's, it's more or less stuff that they pulled right out of the Horus Heresy books. Just going down my list. I mean, I just, I just popped open Steam right now to look at my list of Warhammer 40k games. And there's quite a few. There's Warhammer 40k Armageddon. There's Battle Sector, which we will be talking about in great detail in just a few moments here, because this is Warhammer 40k Battle Sector, unsurprising to pretty much anybody who knows how much I love Blood Angels, is going to be a case study in one of the biggest problems that exists in Warhammer 40k gaming and narrative storytelling. But uh, wait, wait for my full kind of discussion on this topic before you know we get the final verdict on Battle Sector, because of course. Dawn of War 1, 2, and 3. There's Warhammer 40k Eternal Crusade, which is now shut down. And that was the crowdfunded MMO that turned into an arena shooter, more or less. Boy, that that is its own set of problems. There's Warhammer 40k Gladius Relics of War, which doesn't really have much of a story. It's, it's a 4X game. And I'll put some footage up and you'll you'll probably see some of my gaming footage on this episode on the YouTube so that you can look and see a little bit of some of the ones I'm talking about. And also, it's probably a little bit more visually interesting for all of you who just paint or you know do other things while you are listening to this show. But you will see some footage of some of these games here. There is, of course, Warhammer 40k Inquisitor Martyr. There's... Uh, Warhammer 40k Space Brain, there's Chaos Bane, there's Vermintide and Vermintide 2. Those are the ones that are just on my Steam list. That doesn't count all of the the various mobile games that I've downloaded and played, you know, that were free to play over the years and deleted after, you know, hitting that paywall or whatever it may be. Like there's there's a ton of 40k games out. But there aren't any that really hit you to the core in terms of storytelling. Now, Mr. Chief Librarian, you may be saying right now, this is a gratuitous action franchise. Why would I care about the story? Especially when something interactive like a video game, what you're trying to do is you're just trying to animate the toy soldiers that you animate in your brain as you figuratively move them around and shoot their guns on the tabletop, right? Now, in response to you, you dedicated commenter, listener, person, you, who I love dearly. Just because a cheese pizza is delicious doesn't mean that more toppings makes it bad. Now, you can put bad toppings on it. I'm going to throw it out there. Pineapple, bad topping. Again, my show, my opinion. So, but you could also put chicken and red onion and barbecue sauce on there. And all of a sudden, you've got a barbecue chicken cheese pizza. And that's, that's a glorious thing right there. So what I'm saying is, is I want to have my pizza and eat it too. I don't think that we have to settle for bad storytelling in Warhammer video games. Even more than that, I think that the expectations that we set as an audience for storytelling in a video game are so unfortunately modest that we let games, and I think to a certain extent GW lets games and gaming companies get away with this mindset of, well, Despite the decades of established lore, despite the beautiful and tragic backstories behind several of these, and despite the the noble and fantastic efforts of some world-class authors in the Black Library, we somehow don't treat the franchise with enough respect to consider and even demand that the storytelling of these complex characters is more than just regurgitated for the emperors and snarling noises for the Tyranid. So as we get into this, let's let's try and have an honest conversation about it because you have to give the devil his due and the devil is money, right? So everybody wants money. Everybody hates people who have money. So 
let's talk about the money involved in making a video game and having one of these meetings where there are companies that are saying, yeah, we want to make a video game in your franchise because we believe that there's potential there to make money. And indeed, it should because there are people who make their living doing this sort of thing. So imagine you are a video game company X. You are going to Games Workshop with a pitch for a video game or vice versa. Games Workshop has an open house of some kind where they say, this is our idea. This is we need or want someone to bid to make this game. And we want to do this because we want to tap into a market of gamers that would be interested potentially in our tabletop product, but maybe aren't as interested in the tabletop product, but want to play in the universe, only have time for something like a video game. There's a whole bunch of different groups, angles, demographics that people are going to want to try to connect with as part of making a video game. But one of the things that they always want to do no matter whether it is tabletop or video game, is they want to bring in new people. And why do you want to bring in new people? Because they bring in new money that you weren't getting before. And that, of course, brings up a whole new subject, which has to do with accessibility and all of those other marketing and demographic things that you have to be concerned about or think about. And I'm not trying to like solve all of those problems in this discussion. I am simply just pointing out that these are things that exist. These are conversations that inevitably are happening when it comes to designing a video game or any kind of an adaptation. Even when it comes to, to novels and the tabletop, I mean, Kill Team is certainly a 40k gateway drug, right? Star with a little small investment to begin with, and then you want to turn your little Kill Team into a little army because you get very attached to it, etc., etc. That's the hope. That's the dream, right? And eventually, you want all of your consumers to consume all aspects and branches of your products because then they're just continually pouring money into as you're continually releasing. And by diversifying the product, you're able to sell it to a greater number of people because not everybody is interested in Space Marines, but not everybody is interested in Tyranids or Eldar or Chaos either. You have a bunch of different things that can appeal to a bunch of different people, but you keep enough of it in common, the gaming, hobby, painting experience, so that they all, no matter what they're playing, has the ability to engage with it in a similar way. Well, on the tabletop at least. With a video game, it gets a little bit more complicated because gamers in the video game space are not exactly the same as gamers in the tabletop space. And that isn't to say that there isn't some crossing of the streams between the two. There frequently is. But if you're wanting to break into mainstream gaming, what you're trying to do is accomplish a bunch of tasks that a bunch of suits have basically put made a checklist about that talks about, well, you know, people who play video games, they have a short attention span. And this game was successful, and we want to take elements from this game, and we want to put them in our game, because the survey says that people like this sort of thing, at least so far as the AAA studios go, right? It's the small independent gaming studios that tend to have a few more of the original ideas who are a little bit more willing to risk something new in order to accomplish a, a, a different sort of gaming experience for people. And that's been a lot of the reason why indie gaming has taken off so much in the last decade or so. But of course, if you look at the number of indie games that are out there and the number of successful indie games that are out there, there's your risk, right? If you're going to go with one of these indie studios, you have the risk that their idea is not going to pay off. Or maybe the idea doesn't pay off for a really, really long time. Look at uh, Among Us, right? Among Us was out for something like a year and a half before it exploded into the memeverse as a huge, popular mega game. And soon everybody in the gaming space was talking about it. I remember during the pandemic, the ITC judges and I all got together a couple of times to do Among Us. And, you know, it wasn't even something that I was terribly interested in. But my son also got super interested in it. So I started playing that with him and some of my family as well. It just kind of came out of nowhere, but it had been there for a while. So you could even just have a winning idea and it's just there and nobody knows about it because you don't have the money to publicize it yet. And then suddenly word of mouth happens and everything just kind of bursts out of control. But when you're a company like Games Workshop and you're trying to negotiate your product to be delivered in a medium that isn't inside your particular specialty, Games Workshop doesn't have an in-house video game team, then you start making compromises and you start talking about 
ways to make the games more accessible to the maximum number of people because the investment that you're hoping to, to put in and then the return on that investment you're hoping to get out, you want to maximize that as much as possible. Because whether you like it or not, a $20 video game or a $30 video game that delivers X number of hours of experience is a lot easier to dip your toes into than a $150, $200 box set of unpainted, unassembled miniatures with associated rules that you have to buy separately, la di da di da We all know how it works. But here's the thing. If they, I feel like if they really wanted people to dip their toes into the Warhammer 40k universe via a video game, like I'm sure that Dawn of War and Space Marine successfully did, then they have to be willing to tell an interesting story. And it's a story that gives them enough of a taste of the universe to want more, but it's still accessible enough that you don't have to over-explain everything. At least that's the goal. Now, if you ask me, I think that that's treating your consumer base like they're stupid. And if there's anything that gamers hate, it's being considered stupid by the people who create the games they love. So let's look at an example. Let's look at an, an example of a science fiction game that was made by a large studio that involved a preposterous amount of new lore that was based pretty much on nothing else. It was its own original IP, and it became a basically a landmark series, a franchise that developed into four games with another one on the way, presumably, and it didn't treat its people like they were stupid. What it did was it had an encyclopedia, and this encyclopedia filled with just incredible amounts of lore. You could sit and read through that encyclopedia of, of journal entries for hours sometimes, especially in the beginning. I know I did. And I'm talking about the Mass Effect series. Now, you may say, well, Mass Effect is not Warhammer 40k. It is not as established. It doesn't have as much lore. It doesn't have all of that in it, built into it, you know, and all of the baggage that comes from that. It was something fresh. It was like, yes, but it was something that was also very deep and detailed. It was a game that kept you interested and allowed you to move forward. But if you were interested in that depth, if you wanted to get into the politics and the relationships and the history of that universe, there was a space there for you to do it. And it created a very immersive, in-depth world. And it's the sort of thing that I've been waiting to see in a Warhammer 40k video game for my entire, I guess you could say, hobby life. But yes, I mean, sometimes I don't need that, right? Sometimes I'm happy with just the, oh, here is a video game set with the toy soldiers that I love to play with. I want to go bang, bang, boom, boom, kill the bad guys, save for the emperor and be done. Sure, some of that is really fun. And sometimes I don't really have the brain space to think about the complicated stuff. But the games that keep me coming back and playing them again, and the things that truly make me appreciate the art form of video gaming in the same way as you would consider the art form of writing or the art form of gaming on its own. Those things, there hasn't been an experience like that in Warhammer yet, and we need one. So I mentioned before Warhammer 40k Battle Sector, and I have a lot to say about this game. I want to come out the gate and say that I, I liked it. I liked Battle Sector. I liked it, but I didn't love it, and I was so close to loving it. I was just about to, you know, give it my number and invite it over, but it didn't quite hit the love mark. And I will tell you that so far as the gameplay and everything goes, like those those things were really, really polished. I thought that it was done very well. And I'll talk about, you know, the gameplay and the story and some of the mechanics and things in a little bit more detail. But I'm just kind of giving you the the too long didn't read or the TLDL too long didn't didn't listen so far as how Battle Sector was. The gameplay was fun. The, the graphics and the animation and the, the bringing to life of these units was, was interesting. It veered dangerously close to what tabletop Warhammer 40k could be in some cases, almost to the point where there, there were some times I was playing that game and I was like, did GW play this? Are they okay with this? This is so close to playing a tabletop game like in the simulator just animated like it it was one of those things where i was like whoo they really rode close to that line of 
if we release all the factions for this, will this make the tabletop game redundant? Like, it was very close to that in some ways. But the part that killed it for me, it was like, it was like that thing, like, where if, if you, if you are with somebody who you really enjoy spending time with, and you're thinking, like, maybe I want to, to get more serious about this, but then the way that they chew their food just drives you mad, and you think, I could not live with this person chewing their food this way. Like, I could not do that forever. Like, the storytelling in Battle Sector was the chewing for me. And shout out to all of my other friends and foes with Misophonia. Uh, I empathize and sympathize. But so far as telling the story of Battle Sector, oh, you may remember I even talked about in earlier episodes of the show that I was very interested in the story hook that they had, that it was very engaging in the beginning, and that it was very believable for somebody who's familiar with the lore, and especially the lore surrounding the events of the game. And then to be let down like I was, it was just so sad. So let's let's talk a little bit about the gameplay of Battle Sector. And you'll see some, and you've probably already noticed if you're watching this on YouTube, that there's a little bit of gameplay footage going on in the background as I'm talking about this game. Now, the gameplay itself is fairly straightforward. It is, you have your units, they cost points, you select from the points limit the units that either fit within that, or, well, I mean, they must fit within that, or you have to sacrifice or play around a little bit with your your roster so that you can get in. During the story mode, of course, your the characters that you're required to have with you don't cost points, which is kind of nice, until you build one of them into your strategy and they end up being taken away for narrative reasons, and then you're like, oh no, that's a big hole in my strategy. But, you know, that's actually a good move, good good game design move, in my opinion, because it makes you be flexible. That aside, you set up your units in a deployment zone, which is usually done in a Dawn of War style, and Dawn of War, of course, being the long side of the table edge that everyone is used to on the tabletop. And then, like many other turn-based games that you would have played in the past, there are a set number of enemies and types of enemies who interact with your army as they seek their objective. Now, largely, the objective is kill all of the Tyranids. And I can get behind that. But much like the tabletop game, there's only so much you can do. There's a, there's a, a, a fine line to, to cross between kill all the things, and stand in the place, then kill all the things. And a lot of the missions come down to that. But of course, a lot of Warhammer 40k is simply that. And then for the story mode, at least, they add a little bit of a roleplay element into it, where there are bonus objectives that award bonus, basically, victory points, that on top of the victory points you get for doing the mission, you can spend them like currency to enhance your troops and your leaders. It is about as accessible a skill tree scenario and format that you can that you can think of. It's very safe, but it's very comfortable. It's very effective. It does what it's supposed to do. I don't really have any complaints so far as the skill tree and the idea of you're trying to get the bonus objectives so that you can win enough extra points to unlock this cool new ability. I was super stoked when I was able to unlock all of the Flamestorm cannon options for the Bell Predators. And that's just one fantasy on the tabletop that I've never actually really been able to, to live is the full Flamer Predator. Because I have one. I named it Trogdor. Those of you who know, know. But Trogdor, in his, gosh, seven or eight years of service in my army, has killed barely more than... Four Gene Stealers and nine Hormigons before just being completely wiped out all the time. But in this game, it had a health bar and it was able to do wonderful, beautiful, burny, flamey things to my enemies. And it was fun being able to unlock that as an option in the story and seeing how it differed from the assault cannon and heavy bolter version of, of the ball predator. And you would move your units around. They would have a set number of movement points that was arranged in basically square tiles. You could move side to side, directly in front or back or diagonally. You, your facing mattered when it came to, you know, if 
an enemy was attacking you from behind, you were more likely to take more damage. And this is the sort of fine-tuned math that you can do in a video game that doesn't exactly work in a table on, on the tabletop. Like you're not doing when you're deep striking a unit in and charging an enemy unit from the rear, they don't have any penalties for not being faced towards you. But in this game, they might. But when it comes to something like, you know, a, a unit that's moving around some of your units on the tabletop, if you're playing the tabletop game, if you move your, uh, say, your Terminators in front of a melee squad and you just, you aren't charging them, you're just moving around them, they just kind of stand there on the tabletop, right? They stand there and they let your units move around them so that they can go and charge the vulnerable thing behind. Well, in this game, of course, if you get too close to a melee squad, you enter what is called their zone of control and they will jump out and they'll nip at your heels and they'll attack you and you have to really think about that and that is completely based on what direction that squad is facing because it can only influence the three tiles in front of and in front diagonally to the left or right of them. So positioning and things matter in a way that don't matter in Warhammer 40k right now. Some of you longer term veterans may understand the importance of armor facing when it comes to vehicles. Not something that really affected monstrous creatures or anything like that. And you didn't really have to worry about like flanking or anything of that nature unless you played Warhammer Fantasy and you were doing, you know, the big blocks of infantry and you wanted to catch somebody, you know, from the side or from behind because that would give them penalties and new bonuses. And that stuff all worked. Now, so far as the renditions of the models themselves as a sprite in the video game world, the Blood Angels looked a lot like Blood Angels. You know, they did Blood angel -y things. They were colored. They had some of the more unique decorations that you would expect on Blood Angels, though not to an extreme degree. Of course, one of the, the story elements that we'll, that we'll poke at in just a minute here has to do with the integration of the Primaris Marines into the Blood Angels. And like all Primaris that are in the range right now, aside from the new Black Templars, there's almost no decoration or ornamentation on them at all that sets them aside from their other chapter counterparts. And for the setting, this doesn't necessarily break the setting or anything like that. It's more just me complaining again about how boring Primaris Marines are right now. But so far as the appearance of these models and their rendition, like they look like they could have just been taken off the box art and put right right there on the on the video game like you could just you know carbon copy them over and that held true for the tyranids as well though i think the most interesting part of the tyranids was the movement animations because unlike the tabletop where everything's static and nobody moves all of these models had to interact with the environment interact with each other though oftentimes it was just that sort of this is the attack animation it doesn't really matter what you're attacking. You swing your attack animation at it. it. There's a negative number, and sometimes it'll say crit as you smack it with your thunder hammer or your chain sword or your force halberd, and things happen, and damage happens, and sometimes a generic you know, death animation will occur. Like There's nothing terribly fancy about it. It's one of the things that made Dawn of War so interesting is because, you know, it had these sync kills is what I've heard them described as a synchronized duels and, and kills between characters on the map. So if your Space Marine captain was fighting a demon prince and managed to score the final blow, a cool animation would occur where he would jump on top of it and stab it in the neck with a sword or something to that effect that that. Don't quote me on that one. I'm just giving an illustrative example of what it could have been like. So the animations didn't go into so much detail on that point, but it was very cool as someone who's fought Tyranids his entire life on the tabletop to see some of these creatures animate and move around and see how they imagine them performing. I think the, the thing that gave me the, the most ghiblies was the, the Trigon animations, the way that they would pop out of the ground, yeah, and we're used to seeing that Trigon, it's kind of raised up on its tail, very up high, very big and menacing. But as soon as this thing started moving across the map, 
it slithered like this very, very toothy, clawy snake thing. It was very unsettling, and I enjoyed that animation quite a bit. And it seemed to me that they, they did justice to the themes of both of those armies in the story mode, in that the Blood Angels were incentivized to enter into close combat because they would gain basically a spendable resource called momentum. So if you had momentum and you were continuing to engage in combat, you would be able to perform extra actions or special actions and empower your abilities to a certain extent. That was, that was good. And you got, of course, more momentum for melee kills than you did for range kills. But, of course, having ranged in your army was essential to victory. So you had to kind of have this trade-off. And the same for Tyranids. Now, I haven't spent a whole lot of time playing as the Tyranids in multiplayer, but they do receive incentives to keep their Synapse creatures closer to their non-Synapse creatures because their version of Momentum rewards them for melee and ranged kills in a different way. And the calculation for how much momentum they gain has to do with how close they were in proximity to a synapse creature, which feels very useful and effective. I think the Dawn of War 2 did synapse really well as well, but, you know, since we're making comparisons, I have to throw that out there. But the factions felt very authentic in their gameplay style to what their roles were on the tabletop. And... You know, that was especially true for the Exocrines that just blasted things painfully from long range, often from outside of my visibility. And it was very punishing to advance up the map when there was an elevated position with an Exocrine on it that I wasn't aware of. And it caught one of my squads out of cover with, you know, their pants down and all of a sudden they're, they're melted and dead into slag. And this unit that's been gaining veterancy over... The last several missions is now just dead and like, oh gosh, Exocrine again. Boy, I hate that guy. So I I relish the destruction of Exocrines, particularly with my lieutenant and his Thunder Hammer. But, you know, they, they focused on the Blood Angels' unique units to a certain extent. There was the Librarian Dreadnoughts, there was the Sanguinary Priest. They had regular Librarians. Uh, they had Death Company, they had the Ball Predator. They had the Furioso Dreadnought with the Frag Cannon. So it's nice to see that for the most part, when they were selecting the units that you would play with in the game, they decided to pull the most from the things that made the Blood Angels unique on the tabletop range. I think that was a good move. So all of these things, right, are ticking all of these wonderful boxes. Your Tyranids are more Tyranidy around the Synapse creatures. They've got deadly venoms and they've got teeth and they've got swarms and it's really uncomfortable watching a turvagon give birth to a new squad of uh termagants because i mean you can imagine though I, I will say as a slight criticism on the tyranid part some of their their like creature noises were very underwhelming the carnifexes were kind of adorable i mean they didn't look adorable but they sounded adorable when you attacked them like, imagine kind of like a small dog warbling into a vacuum tube or something. That's kind of what the Carnifex sound. But some of the other ones were suitably terrifying and, and gross and, and monstrous sounding. The, the Hive Tyrant itself, the winged Hive Tyrant with the Venom Cannon, that thing was a very dangerous uh, beast. And the, the Hive Guard live up to their tabletop reputation for sure. So all of these things are points in its favor, right? You've got the armies feel like how they're supposed to for people who know the tabletop. They function effectively in the video game space as well. They've got all of the, the accuracies visually to represent them on, on the tabletop. You know, the venom thropes make it much more difficult to hit in ranged and shooting environments. You know, the Tyranid Primes and their bone swords were very effective at cutting down characters and doing lots of damage. Now, the Death Company had a really, really cool mechanic where if they killed models in a in a hand-to-hand -hand combat, they would let out this bestial roar that was a stacking buff. There was also a stacking debuff in terms of their ability to evade incoming damage. Like all of that's working, right? And you can you can forgive some of the the awkward animations because at least they're animated and they're doing the things that they should be doing in the animation, even if it takes a little while for that character to back up 
into his designated square after he flattens something with his thunder hammer. All of these things going in the game's favor until they're trying to tell the story. And this is where my critique gets a little bit harsher. And truly, I mean, if there's anyone from Slytherin who is you know, listening to this and thinking about, you know, oh my gosh, he's just going to just, I, I tried so hard to make this work and he's just going to roast me over it because he's a picky Blood Angel fanboy. It's like, well, yes, a little bit, but I'm, I don't want to discount the work that you did put into it. I'm not saying that there's no work that's been done to it. It's just, this is the thing that it needed the most help with. And if you can accept that, you know, that criticism in the spirit of which it's given, the spirit of, you could do this again and you could make this amazing the next time because absolutely I think the battle sector was worth the money that I spent on it, then yeah, you're, you're taking this the right way. Don't take it the wrong way. But nothing is perfect. Everything can be improved. And when it comes to Blood Angels and lore, this is kind of my specialty. So I'm not going to apologize for giving you honest feedback on it. And hopefully... Everyone who hasn't played and who is listening to this finds the feedback useful. And if you have rebuttals to it, I'm more than willing to, to hear it because that whole nothing is perfect thing applies to me as well. Now, in the beginning, I was very interested in the story hook that they put in here. Is that this is just after Gilliman has arrived and you know the devastation of Ball has occurred. And for anybody who's a Blood Angel fan, or, or even someone who knows Tyranid lore to, to a certain extent in the last you know four or five years, the Blood Angels were almost wiped out here. And there's a lot of different reasons and things you can go into, but at this point, it's at the rebuilding stage. And the remnants of the Tyranids that are on ball, that are in the system, need to be dealt with. And specifically, this Sergeant of the 8th Company has been tasked with eliminating the Tyranids that are on on the second moon of Baal called Balfora, which I think is another name for it is Baal Indicus. It might be Baal Fortunata. I could I could have it wrong here, just off the top of my head. My all of my notes on this subject are locked away in boxes at the moment, so bear with me here. Nevertheless, the the moon was pretty badly damaged by the Tyranids. It was pretty heavily infested. The capital city, Angel's Fall, where the giant statue of Sanguinius where, that was built where his pod landed on the moon, like that almost fell. That's where the Astronomicon was. Like in that, that was a really crucial part of the devastation because it was one of the ast astropaths there who was able to pick up the message from Gilliman that they were coming and, and sort of guide them through the, the maelstrom of the warp, so to speak, at the very least, let them know that something was there waiting for them that was friendly. But all the leftover Tyranids need to be dealt with. And so here's this 8th Company Sergeant. And as he is going through the initial missions, you know, the missions that are like, here are your basic units and here are the different things you can do to, you know, get used to playing the game now. All of a sudden, things are starting to ramp up because there is organized resistance among the Tyranids. And the concern grows that all of those ships, like the, the millions upon millions of hive ships that were sucked into the warp when the Cicatrix Maledictum opened up, could somehow be pulled back into this focus point around a synaptic network that exists on this very spiritually and lore-relevant, you know, important moon you know, that they could bring all of those Tyranids back all of a sudden, like, that's bad news. That's a really, that's a good crisis. You know, that's good writing because it shows a familiarity with the conflict. It's like, oh, you know, this uh, this Hail Mary, this Deus Ex Machina thing that happened? Here is something that risks undoing that. It fits excellently in with the time period that the story takes place in. It's very believable that something like this could have happened. And it definitely puts, you know, the stakes in the appropriate place. Because with the whole of the Indominus Crusade, or at least this branch of it that Gilliman has taken, the, a resurgence of the High Fleets would certainly be a big problem, even for them. So, playing as this sergeant turned lieutenant, because now lieutenants are back, and here we go, we have our firstborn lieutenant. He is tasked with 
collecting all of these different units and, and organizing this force from the 8th Company into a fighting force that can deal with all of these synaptic nodes that have been set up on you know, Ball Secundus. Good. At this point, you've got me. I'm hooked. I'm invested. I definitely don't want the Tyranids to come back. I want to kill all the Synapse creatures because I get a lot of satisfaction in life doing that sort of thing. And you've shown me that you have at least a passing familiarity with the lore. And you found a really, really good hook to, to sink into it and to find your place in it. Good. At this point, full marks. A+. Plus. I'm loving it. I'm into it. Here's where things start getting a little bit problematic. So far, the campaign has been set in more or less what's three arcs, maybe four, you know, depending on how you decide to divide these things up. But in the first arc, it's just you as the Blood Angel Sergeant. You're gathering, you know, you, you find your, your tech marine and he's guarding a librarian dreadnought who they're worried might be falling to the rage soon. And you find, a you know, there's a sanguinary priest who comes to help and he does the sanguinary priest things of healing things and being, you know, very spiritual and moral and all that sort of thing. So you get through this first act, and then in the second act, the Sisters of Battle show up. Now, I'm, I'm going to stop right there, because I, I have to clarify something. And I feel like, I hate that I have to clarify this, but this is not a girls are bad rant that's coming in. This is a storytelling rant. Because honestly, when in the previous to this game, when I saw that there were Sisters of Battle... You know, I thought, hey, this is pretty cool. Maybe it will be this cool sacred order that I can build on the tabletop to go along with my own Blood Angels force that I can say, oh, well, they're relevant to my army and as, a, as an allied force for Crusade because this order served in the, the cleansing campaign of Ball Secundus. Like, that's, that's cool. I was into that. But nowadays, it can feel like if you're about to offer criticism about something that's related to a particular group of people, that your criticism is dismissed by virtue of your own identity. And I'm not going to tolerate that, because that's not what this critique is about. This critique is about bad storytelling that breaks the immersion and destroys suspension of disbelief. So what does that mean, that breaks the suspension of disbelief? Well, we all go into any sort of fiction with a suspension of disbelief. The scale of Warhammer 40k is such that we tend to take for granted how ludicrously big everything is and the scale that things happen at. And this also includes some of the feats that individuals can accomplish as part of this universe. I mean, the things that space marines can do with all of the extra organs and everything. It's one of the foundational things of, of Warhammer 40k. It is preposterous in its scale. That being said, there are also things that we take for granted as people who understand and know the lore that when something comes out that is completely contradictory to what is established in the universe, we notice and it bothers us. Now, my initial impressions of the Sister of Battle character who is introduced in Act 2, her name is Sister Verity, and I believe that she is a sister superior, so she's the equivalent of a squad leader, and she is not the canoness. She specifically is not the canoness. Much like our main character, this sergeant turned lieutenant, is not the captain of the 8th Company, but is a lieutenant of the 8th Company. Now, when you think of a sister of battle, there are probably a few different things that you think of. I have read several of the established lore novels regarding the Sisters of Battle, I don't own any of the codexes, but I have seen plenty of Sisters of Battle across the Warhammer universe and various other sources. I mean, even the, the second book of the Dawn of Fire series heavily features a convent of the Sisters of Battle, and there is a general theme that goes along with them. It's basically a severe faith and fervor that drives them to incredible acts and inspires them and, and makes them capable of these miracles, but is uncompromising. However, it is also incredibly inspiring when those miracles and things happen. We know that the Sisters of Battle often revere the works of the Emperor as an extension of the Emperor, and that passes along to Space Marines to a certain extent. 
and particularly considering some of the spiritual and allegorical similarities that Sisters of Battle and Blood Angels have, and the respect that the Sisters of Battle would have for a chapter such as the Blood Angels, it goes without saying that when Sister Verity appears on the scene, strutting her stuff, talking down to the Blood Angels, and being condescending to them, it just doesn't mesh well with what the image of a battle sister in this situation would be. Now, let's counter that briefly. So, sister of battle is not always going to be the same way. There are always variances between people. There are certainly personality variances between members of Space Marines in the same chapter. Like, I'm not talking about a, a difference in personality. What I'm talking about is a character who did not sound like a sister of battle, especially considering her rank in the game. Our initial introduction to her character is that she is a survivor of a Storm Raven gunship crash where all of the Space Marines died, but she lived in a couple groups of her battle sisters. Okay, I mean, fine. But she's got these lines that are just like, this isn't the first time my transport's been shot out from underneath me. But where I'm saying it in kind of a jokey voice, she's saying it with scorn and contempt. And yes, you could argue that there is scorn and contempt in the Sisters of Battle, at least so far as the mutant, the heretic, the sinner is concerned. But to treat this lieutenant, who's a sergeant, and a sergeant up until the coming of Gilman, would have been someone who would be a candidate for captain, likely has well over a century or more of battle experience, could be even longer, because this is the Blood Angels, and they tend to live healthily longer than other space marines. And she's talking down to him like he's a child. And this by itself wouldn't be immersion-breaking for me. It is a little jarring, and it just seems very counterintuitive that a sister of battle would approach entering combat with some of the Emperor's chosen sons, the Lieutenant, sons of the Great Angel, I was led to one of the greatest you blood martyrs on behalf of the Emperor quickly. who ever existed in the Imperium, the second most worshipped being in the Imperium, and the only thing that she can summon is this condescending contempt. Now, the, the reason that they have an outsider in this story is because if you are invested in the Blood Angel story already, you know that the Black Rage is a thing. You know that Death Company are a unit because, I mean, it's, it's on the art. You know what's going to happen. So, what is the default thing that anybody who has half a brain cell would do to add tension to a scenario? Well, you bring in an outsider right? Because an outsider doesn't know the secret. You know, the outsider can bring tension. And when the outsider eventually, predictably, learns of the deep, dark secret, that's kind of an open secret among the entire community at this point, then that creates an opportunity for conflict between the two parties. And normally this role would be filled by an inquisitor. And frankly, that's more of who she sounded like. If they had changed her to be an inquisitor, I think most of my complaints of this matter would probably go away, though it is likely that the Inquisition is already aware of the Black Rage and the implications that follow. They love to have that little leverage in their pockets. Nevertheless, a sister superior, a effectively a squad leader for a unit in the Sisters of Battle, does not strike me as the type of intimidating authority figure that anybody in the Blood Angels chapter would need to be afraid of. Furthermore, her ability to travel around this war zone, she doesn't even have her own tanks or her own vehicles, her own aircraft. She is completely dependent on the Blood Angels in order to do the assistance that she needs to do. Having been ordered to support this effort by Gilliman, she doesn't really take to her task with the zeal you would expect of a sister of battle. She just kind of is there. So you have this character who's supposed to be there as an outsider to build tension about the secret of the Black Rage. And of course, this is most prominent with the librarian Dreadnought who is apparently on the verge of falling. But even more than that, there is eventually going to be a confrontation with members of the Death Company themselves. And this all happens in a very predictable fashion. But the setup is not right. 
the threat of this outsider is not a threat at all. It's barely even there. Furthermore, if this was meant to be an introduction to the Black Rage and the Blood Angels and the Flaw, then talking about the Flaw from the very beginning of the game and having this sort of, what would you call it, a metagaming understanding of the Flaw, in as much as the characters all understand what the Black Rage is before you're ever introduced to Sister Verity. So, by virtue of their conversation, even if it is a new person to the Warhammer universe, the explanation of the Black Rage is already kind of there. There's nothing for the, the player to discover that hasn't already either been implied or outright explained by the game at this point. And if you were trying to create that kind of drama, then the player should actually be playing the part of Sister Verity from the beginning, going on that journey of discovery and being exposed to the dark secret. And then... As Sister Verity, you have to figure out how are you going to get back to your canoness or your confessor and explain to them what happened, especially considering that you're completely dependent on these warriors who you intend to out for transportation. Like You can't go anywhere without them. You ride in their Storm Ravens, you ride in their Rhinos. Now that that is a very different video game, but that that perspective is actually one that would work a little bit better especially if Sister Verity is written as somebody who is a squad leader in the Sisters of Battle, venerates the Space Marines like many Sisters of Battle do, and then is exposed to something dark and traumatic that horrifies her and shakes her faith and understanding. You know, and then you can have this moment where she is trying to reconcile this image of the Blood Angels that she had with the reality of, and she'll have that opportunity to, do I see the beauty in this madness and what they're trying to accomplish with it? Or do I view it as an abomination? And frankly, it doesn't make sense for her to view it as an abomination in either scenario, the game that we're playing or the game that I'm writing right now. Because the Sisters of Battle often use maddened, drug-fueled, cyber-implanted, crazed individuals to go out and fight and earn repentance or salvation by suicide, basically. There are entire units in the Sisters of Battle army that are dedicated to this very thing. But with the inevitable reveal of the Black Rage to Sister Verity, her response is that it is an abomination before the eyes of the Emperor, and it is this terrible, awful thing and she's going to have to out everybody to her confessor, and she's practically begging to be shot. This is bad writing. But the part that got me the most, so far as Sister Verity and the Sisters of Battle was concerned, was that there's a, there's a mission that you play through, and it's the first one after you rescue her from the crashed Storm Raven. And during the course of the mission, a single unit of Gene Stealers is revealed in this formerly, what would you call it, formerly civilian-occupied area. All the civilians, of course, have been evacuated from Baal Secundus, and they were part of the defense of the Arx Angelicum during the Siege of Baal, but there are gene stealers here, and gene stealers are a problem. And not just at department stores, because I couldn't resist making that joke one more time. Okay, and if I have an, an audio recording of this clip, I'll try and play that here. If I don't, expect me to just read out this screenshot. I'll put it up on the screen here, if that's the case. So the first slide of this is... Sister Verity, in the pre-mission, after meeting the Gene Stealer, saying, The Space Marines don't understand the danger of this abhorrent threat. It is tragic evidence of how far they have strayed from their mortal origins. They don't understand that these Xenos are more than just targets for their rifles. So, first slide, already really bad. Second slide, if even one Gene Stealer should escape here, every person that survived Leviathan will have done so for naught. They will all die. Not tomorrow, nor the next day, but the infection will linger, biding its time, eventually overwhelming this moon, ball, and the entirety of the Red Scar. So, again, this is likely written so that a, a new player who has no idea what gene stealers do, and is not familiar with the universe, can understand what exactly it is that gene stealers do. But the way that this is presented, as opposed to a a learning experience for the player role-playing uh, a role in this game 
Instead, you have Sister Verity, a mere sister superior amid the vast empire of man, lecturing and condescending to the blood angels about the risks of gene stealer infestation. Okay, I don't know if the people who make the game know this, but gene stealers and blood angels have been clashing for decades. I mean, there was an entire incident that was the sort of prologue or the pregame to the Space Hulk game, the tabletop board game that featured Blood Angel Terminators fighting gene stealers in a Space Hulk. The entire chapter nearly died. It was almost completely wiped out by a gene stealer infestation on a Space Hulk. If there is any one Space Marine chapter that knows what gene stealers are, the dangers they pose on the battlefield and off the battlefield, the Blood Angels would certainly be in the top five, if not the top three, if not number one. The clash of Tyranid versus Blood Angel has become so ingrained into the lore, it is a multi-edition rivalry. And it is a rivalry that me, as a Blood Angel player, has been playing out for the entirety of my career as a Blood Angel player, which now goes upwards of 20 years. So to hear Sister Verity, who likely wouldn't have known anything about Tyranids or Gene Stealers, aside from perhaps some exposure to a heretical gene stealer cult at some point. Who knows? But of course, that's us inventing a reason that the game doesn't give us that she might know what this is about. Going so far as to claim that the Blood Angels have no idea the threat the gene stealers pose. And it was this moment where I completely lost all of my engagement in the storytelling here. If you need to explain the dangers of gene stealers to a new person to the universe, there are much better ways to do that than to take your protagonist faction, emasculate them, and make them look like idiots with somebody like Sister Verity, who has less battle experience than the majority of the surviving battle brothers of the Blood Angels chapter. The sergeant turned lieutenant likely was fighting in wars before this sister's grandmother was born. Now, once again, if you were playing as Sister Verity, if you were the player interacting with the Blood Angels and having that sort of introduction into the universe experience where it's the Blood Angels who are teaching you about this threat that they have loads of experience with, and you as a new person to the universe are learning about this firsthand as part of that, that is a great way to introduce that to a new user. It certainly isn't proper in the universe for a squad leader of a Sisters of Battle unit to be speaking around and about the Blood Angels in this manner. And so far as the Blood Angels themselves are written at this point, the interaction with Sister Verity is awkward on their part as well. The lieutenant himself takes a very soft-handed, gentle approach to his conversations with the sister. He's always kind. He typically finds a way to compliment her, even when she talks down to him or treats him like he is less important or secondary to the mission. She certainly doesn't show him the respect that you would expect someone to show a colleague. And his interactions aren't really too much. But then things start to stray a little bit so far as the Sanguinary Priest is concerned. Now, in terms of the spiritual guidance of the Blood Angels, that falls to the Sanguinary Priesthood and the Chaplaincy. Now, there are no chaplains in this game, so only the the Council of Blood is present from the Council of Bone and Blood, and the Sanguinary Priest, who would normally be an aspect of hope, archetypally throughout the Blood Angels chapter, is instead relegated to this role of the Dark Whisperer, the one who's saying, she's seen too much, or she's getting close to the truth, we're going to have to kill her. Now, let's pause for a second and acknowledge the fact that that is a very 40k thing to do. It is very 40k for the sake of a secret for a character to be killed off, but it's very unlikely that the Sanguinary Priest would be the one to recommend that course of action, in my opinion. If there were a chaplain here, and chaplains are known to be very 
fervent and severe. Nevertheless, the chaplain isn't here, so this duty falls to the sanguinary priest. It's this role that they put him in. So instead of this uh, hopeful spiritual character, which the sanguinary priesthood is supposed to exemplify the, the great virtues of the angel, he is now the dark whisperer. And this comes to a head at the end of the story, where after she has seen the librarian dreadnought fall to the black rage and the consequences of that and understanding everything that she was potentially at risk for if the dreadnought had fallen while they were traveling together, she pretty much just tells them outright, I'm going to tell your dark secret to my confessor. And the sanguinary priest is coming up to this lieutenant and saying, we can't let her go. But the, the lieutenant makes the call. He's like, no, it's going to be fine. We'll just let her go. And then all of that tension just gets washed away in that moment. It's very anticlimactic. So I don't have a problem with the Sisters of Battle being there. In fact, I think that if they were trying to tell that story, the story of the discovery of the Black Rage and the risks involved with an outsider knowing it, that having the Sisters of Battle be the real you know, protagonists of the story would have been the better call if that's the story you're trying to tell. Instead, it's sort of this ham-fisted side story that not only detracts from the primary goal of taking out these synapse nodes, but ruins the immersion to the point where you don't really feel like you're engaged with the story anymore. At least I didn't. I think that the character of Sister Verity was underserved by the storytelling here. Because if you're going to you know, make, make a complaint, like there, I, can, I can already hear some people criticizing, saying, oh, well, he's just a, threatened by the presence of a strong female character. Like, well, where exactly was she strong? Like, is, is exemplifying all of the traits of toxic masculinity what constitutes a strong woman in video games? Do we want to portray our women as the worst caricatures of what the quote-unquote toxic masculinity looks like? I don't think so. And my wife agrees with me. Now, my wife and I, we spend a lot of our time gaming together. At least we certainly did prior to having a baby. We would play StarCraft co-op together. And one of the reasons that we connected over StarCraft was we both loved the game. But the character that made my wife love StarCraft was Sarah Kerrigan. And the thing that made Kerrigan special to my wife was that she was this strong, intelligent, cunning, dynamic character who was also extremely feminine. And not every character, especially not every female character, has to be like Sarah Kerrigan. But Sarah Kerrigan was well-written and executed brilliantly, particularly as a competent villain. And I could, you know, I could do a whole essay probably on the character development of Sarah Kerrigan throughout StarCrafts 1 and 2. Needless to say that when we're looking at how we want to write characters, that we want them to have that kind of depth, regardless of the, the, the archetype that they're trying to play, whether it's a villain, whether it's an antagonist, whether it's a foil, whatever it is, we want them to be more than just a caricature. We want character. And any men who are written in the same way as Sister Verity are not really interesting characters either. Now, I'm just getting started doing some skirmishes and getting into sort of the multiplayer and the balanced version. This, you know, that kind of goes into the full game review territory. And I don't want to get too much further lost in the weeds here because this segment is actually already an hour as it is. And I still haven't talked about why I think some of the better written 40K games have worked like Dawn of War 2 and like Space Marine. And I want to do that. I just had to use Battle Sector as an example of where storytelling in Warhammer tends to miss the mark. It's a place where a desire to teach a new person about the universe can actually turn into a turnoff, not just for the new person, because if the new person is looking at the Sisters of Battle and thinks that Sister Verity is an exemplar of their ideals, they're not going to be interested in that. But they're also not going to believe that a proud and noble Space Marine chapter with over 10,000 years of tradition is going to accept being talked down to by her. A newbie to the universe can learn all of the same things that they were trying to teach through Sister Verity 
with better storytelling in a more engaging way. And you could still do it in the same sort of game with the same sort of protagonist and have a character like Sister Verity and the Sisters of Battle as supporting characters and not make these same mistakes. So the story got derailed by this whole sidebar into the exposure of the Black Rage because by the end of the final act where I have just killed the Hive Tyrant that is the orchestrator of this node and all of that, I've already forgotten what the stakes are at this point. I was supposed to kill that Hive Tyrant so that it didn't bring back all of the Tyranid Hive Fleets that got sucked into the warp. But that threat got lost underneath the baggage that came from the Black Rage Discovery sidebar. Even more than that, the communications that were coming from Chapter Command, like Captain Matarno, did nothing to reinforce the stakes that were already laid. It was like listening to a supervisor tell a subordinate, hey, I need you to accelerate getting this task done. This is making our department look bad, as opposed to saying, we're detecting increased activity from the warp. We're concerned that whatever is going to happen to bring the Leviathan fleet back is happening now. We're having disturbances. The shadow in the warp is, is la di da da There's nothing that's adding to that tension. Instead, it's all focused on this sidebar with Sister Verity. You finish killing the Hive Tyrant, and instead of the relief that the risk posed by this Hive Tyrant and the return of Hive Fleet Leviathan is now extinguished and eliminated, that was the very first thing that you were trying to do in the first place with this game, it immediately talks about the resolution to the Black Rage exposure. And to conclude that with, essentially, I'm surprised that you let me live considering what I've seen. Tell me, did you know that this was a risk the whole time? By the way, I'm definitely going to tell everybody your secret. And then to have the lieutenant be like, nah, this is fine. It, it'll be fine. Which implies a sense of trust in the relationship that the two characters have developed fighting side by side, of which there has been no evidence of that. There is no evidence of them gaining respect for each other. There is no situation that required their teamwork in order to make it happen. Nothing in the gameplay or in the story surrounding it engendered trust and understanding and empathy between the two characters. So if you're selling to me that this lieutenant is making this call to trust in the outcome of the outing of his chapter's greatest secret to a very arrogant and condescending sister of battle who is more than willing to tell everybody, telling a confessor, right, who will likely report that up the ladder, like, this, it, you're not selling this to me very well. And you've just undermined the entirety of the excellent premise to the beginning of this game. These, these two threads should have been two different stories. It could have potentially been a, you know, a supporting campaign or an additional story mode on top of the original one. But there was this great setup and this incredible letdown. And neither of these plot lines were developed to what they could have been. And I don't exactly know why they would have made the choice to do that. I felt that it was a disservice to both the Blood Angels and the lore and also to the Sisters of Battle in the lore. So if that is an example of where 40k storytelling goes wrong in video games, let's look at the things that worked in some of the other examples that I gave you. And we'll start with Space Marine. So Space Marine benefited quite a bit from the type of game that it was. So yes, you're playing as an Ultramarines captain, you're coming in and you're immediately doing Space marine -y things. You jump out of an airship in the middle of a war zone, you land on top of a cruiser and single-handedly destroy it and send it crashing down to the ground where you surf it down to the surface of the planet and you have firmly established yourself and your character as a consummate cool dude, you know? That's the space marine fantasy. And that fantasy is what the gameplay focuses on. It focuses on giving you that Ability to feel powerful when surrounded by groups of incredibly strong enemies. And then the story is very linear. 
you have your objective. You're trying to get from point A to point B. You're trying to reunite with your battle brothers. You're trying to coordinate the defense with the surviving planetary defense force. And then you have a military objective that you need to do. And during the course of this, you're learning as you explore using these little servo skulls, some of what the invasion was like. You see in the background the scale of the war. You see this huge cannon firing into space that's been commandeered by the orcs. It's the biggest gun you could ever imagine so far as you know, a person on a planet looking at a, a planetary defense station. Like, it hadn't ever really been portrayed in a visible way to 40k fans at this point. The captain has cool confidence. His foil, of course, is in everyone's favorite guy to hate, Leandros. You have the trusted veteran mentor character, who by virtue of his status is destined to die, and so he does. All of these things are working, and the gameplay is in support of it. You have a ton of enemies you need to wade through to get through to your next objective. You have some story bits about the background and the, the conflict of the war that you pick up along the way, but you're always trying to get the next thing done, and it's not getting distracted with sidebars. In the beginning, everything is about the orc invasion. And even the distress signal that you receive from the Inquisitor is a story point that leads you ostensibly towards an objective that can cleanse the orcs from this world, ending the war. Now, of course, the game has the classic, the Inquisitor is actually evil, mwahaha story bit, which is a bit of an overused failing of lore right now. It's like, oh, the Inquisitor is bad. Maybe, I don't know. It's like, well, we'll, we'll think about it this way. Is the context of the word Inquisitor in history positive or negative? So already, even if he's a quote unquote good Inquisitor, he's also already extremely bad just by the, the use of the word as the title. And it's done that way deliberately. So it's just like doubling down on the badness. Now, you can make the argument, well, it was actually the body of the Inquisitor and he was possessed by a demon. Well, we're splitting hairs at this point. It was very clear to anybody who was familiar with the lore, but also anybody who is just familiar with storytelling and tells anyway, that there was something kind of off with how the Inquisitor was acting. However... His authority was real. You understood that even this consummate cool dude, Captain Titus, who can surf on orc battleships to the surface of the planet, he still has to take orders from a dude with an inquisitorial rosette. That guy means business. These are things that the game doesn't explain to you heavy-handedly. It doesn't take the time to have the Inquisitor in a pre-mission loading screen say to you, I am an Inquisitor, and I, as the Inquisitor, have the ultimate authority. No one save the Emperor can countermand me. So it has been since the days of the Horus Heresy. Like, you don't have that. You just keep going. Like, the story keeps moving forward. And when the inevitable betrayal happens, rawr, you know, let your dinosaurs kill each other now, the, the payoff is that now it's not just orcs, it's also chaos dudes. You have dudes now and demons who are coming through, fighting and killing. They're much more dangerous than your standard orc. And now stuff just got real. The difficulty amps up and the threat of the orcs is still present. However, the greater threat of chaos behind the whole thing kind of un underpins that. So the game, by the way, with the arrival of chaos does not actually take away from that catharsis of actually ending the, the orc invasion, you do get that final payoff. You do get to fight that war boss and basically cut the head off of the orcs. And then you get to focus on the bigger threat. The stakes go up, the action picks up, and it builds up to this final act where you're desperately trying to keep the MacGuffin from getting into the hands of the bad guy. You almost succeed in doing so, but your mentor slash best friend gets killed. So now not only is the story driving you because it's your duty to fight and win against chaos, you are also wanting to avenge your mentor character. 
And in the background, you have sniveling Leandros who's conspiring behind you. I mean, and that was probably the most narrative breaking thing about this was the sort of dogmatic approach to the codex that Leandros had and his willingness to report on his captain to the Inquisition. Leandros, that's not the way to get promoted, buddy. Or rather, that's the way to get promoted briefly until everyone realizes how insufferable you are and you end up losing the job anyway. But the final payoff of the game is the sort of world-ending battle where this proto-transformative Demon Prince Chaos Lord guy and you have this incredible battle at the, the top of this very important location in the spire and then you are riding him down from the crumbling ruins of the spire and beating him up as you're fighting in midair in pure space marine awesomeness. And if, you, you know, if you're good enough at the game to do that, then you win, and the game ends with you being taken away by the Inquisition for your warp resistance. And it's all left very vague, and it's not very over-explained, but it's set up perfectly for a sequel. Now, no one is giving Space Marine the story, like an A-plus for originality, but it's not trying to do something except what it was set out to do in the first place. The action supported the story, and the story drove the action forward. And it's why Space Marine has that special place as a first-person shooter, and perhaps the best first-person shooter that has ever come out for Warhammer 40, 40k or, or in Fantasy. Space Marine worked. I love that about it. And I'm hoping that they don't try and get too deep into the weeds in the sequel here. Already the trailer has us asking a lot of questions, and it's good to have your audience interested and, and have them have a desire to learn more. You know, I think that's a good thing. But we'll have to wait and see if they fall into some of these pitfalls like Battle Sector did, where they're trying to over-explain the universe. They're treating their audience like they're dumb. They're making newbie writing mistakes. And they're no longer letting the action support the story and the story support the action. We will just have to wait and see. Now, let's talk about Dawn of War 2 a little bit. Uh, a lot of people have a soft spot for Dawn of War 1 and the subsequent expansions to Dawn of War 1. You know, Winter Assault, Dark Crusade, yada, yada, yada. And they hold that up as this is the pinnacle of, of a 40k RTS. And they have their reasons for doing that. I, I disagree personally. And a lot of that has to do with just the like reinforcing in the field and some of the things that just didn't really make a whole lot of sense to me from a, um, I guess, from an immersion perspective. But from a gameplay perspective, it was a good mechanic. It worked, you know. But that's not what I'm here to talk about. What I'm here to talk about is a story. And I played through the Dawn of War 1 story. And it was very trite and contrived. It was not an engaging narrative, and it kept the kid gloves on the whole time. It had the, the librarian tempted to fall to chaos, because of course it did. And it's not just because the show is called The Chief Librarian, and I resent the fact that librarians f fell to chaos in the first game. That has very little, not nothing, but very little to do with my review here. But the cheesy way in which it was delivered. And the cheesiness is, I guess, part of the flavor of Dawn of War 1. But you know, its strengths were not in the storytelling, it was in the gameplay. Now, what Dawn of War 2 did that I thought was much better and much more interesting is it turned it into an RTS RPG where you, yes, the scale was down, you didn't have as many units, you didn't have as, you know, as large a force as you did in Dawn of War 1 when you're playing the game. You weren't commanding armies so much as you were commanding elite squads, but each one of those squads was helmed by a character that was given great personality and traits. And while they did still introduce you to the concepts of the Warhammer 40k universe, much in the same way that Dawn of War 1 was expected to, they at least did not treat you like an idiot while you were playing. For many of these characters, learning about the Tyranids, who were the main antagonist in the main game of Dawn of War 2, was a, an exercise in learning for everyone involved. Now, there was one character, there was Cyrus, I believe his name was, uh, voiced by the legendary Steve Bloom, who 
some of you may remember as being the voice of Spike Spiegel in Cowboy Bebop, and he's done a ton of other stuff. He's done like Wolverine. He's a very famous voice actor. Don't know why I'm fanboying over him right now. But the the thing about that game was is that this was the mentor character. He had served with the Death Watch. He knew who the Tyranids were. And his narrative about the Tyranids, his experiences with the Tyranids, served as a tension-building backdrop to the scale of the threat that wasn't something that even people who played Dawn of War 1 would have been familiar with because Tyranids were not a faction that you could play in the first Dawn of War. And as you are playing this game and going through the, the story elements because you're fighting the Tyranids, but there's this backdrop of Eldar interference, and of course the orcs are invading because no 40k game starts without the orcs invading. Well, I'm being a little bit hyperbolic there, but it always just seems like the orcs come in, they're looking for a good fight, they're the real, they're the real problem, until the actual real problem shows up and steals their thunder. Sad was. Nevertheless, as you are pursuing these things, there is this counter that's available for you to see between missions. And the threat of the Tyranids continues to build and build and build. And each mission that you do will take down that counter a certain amount, but as you keep doing missions, as you keep pursuing things, the, the scale of the threat increases and the Tyranid presence on each of these worlds that you're fighting over continues to grow and grow and grow to the point where these maps, and oftentimes you're fighting on the same map over and over again as you go to the same place over and over again, you're starting to see the Tyranid hive spines show up. Like the map is, is supporting the narrative here by showing the growing infestation. And then you, as the force commander, you are basically like a, almost kind of like a master chief, except master chief actually gets to talk. But you are this force commander and you are experiencing all this with everybody, and the, your silence is actually serving a purpose because you can build your character to be a ranged powerhouse or to be a melee powerhouse. I mean, for me, it was always melee. It was always jump packs, you know, thunder hammers sometimes. Sometimes it was the best power swords I could get. And nevertheless, you are playing as this character, and your character is developing in a gameplay style, and the way that you choose your objectives and the way that you accomplish the bonus objectives is a reflection of your character's actions and their impact on this world you know, and on this system. The storytelling here builds up to a satisfying climax. And as much as the Eldar and the Orcs offer kind of the, uh, the side hustle in terms of story, the focus always stays on the Tyranid threat. In the end, what you're trying to do is defeat the Hive Ship. And you're trying to find a way to do that. And it requires you to go around, save the person, find the MacGuffin, defeat the blah, 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 so that the blah, blah, blahs can support you doing your thing. Everything is focused around the Tyranid threat, even to a certain extent, the interference of the Eldar and the Orcs themselves. You have this story that has a very clear focus, and the gameplay is in support of the story, and the story informs the gameplay. That's why Dawn of War 2, I believe, has better writing and a better and more satisfying story than Dawn of War 1. And that, that flows all the way into Chaos Rising, where you have the same sort of buildup, where you're now you have Chaos as a foe, and they become your primary focus, and the gameplay loop changes to now account for the potential for Chaos Corruption, which is something that a lot of gamers really like the role-playing aspect of it. Added a morality system to something that was, you know, you're you're expected to see, you know, a a character go traitor or something like that to be tempted by chaos, but to have your own character tempted by chaos and to perhaps make that choice as a as a morality choice that adds some depth to the tension of the story. Going beyond that, you have Dawn of War to Retribution, and Retribution is where I think it ends up being weakest, but at the same time, Retribution was their attempt to give everybody a chance to play through the game with the faction of their choice being the main, you know, the main faction, as opposed to just having to play Space Marines all the time. You could play through the campaign in Dawn of War 2 Retribution 
as Imperial Guard. You could do it as Orcs. You could do it as Chaos. You could do it as Space Marines. You could do it as Eldar. You could do it as Tyranids. And that was one of the, the strengths and the weaknesses because they built a game so that every single mission that you did was the same no matter which race you picked. But you had to, you know, they at least gave you the, the pretext to understand that what you're trying to do fundamentally is a benefit to your faction. It would have certainly been better if each if each army had its own bespoke sort of, what would you call it, objective and missions and things. But at the same time, I went through almost every single one of those. The only one I didn't do was Chaos. Chaos just isn't interesting to me. But I, I went through pretty much every other one and played through it. And it got very repetitive. But I was very interested in seeing what the different races and factions would say when presented with some of the situations provided by the scenarios. What, what was going to be the story hook? And... Yeah, Dawn of War 2 Retribution was probably the weakest link out of the three, but it did have the most diverse gameplay in the multiplayer, and it has a very, very strong scene with the Elite mod, but that's a, that's a different conversation. Overall, though, Dawn of War 2 had better storytelling than Dawn of War 1, and I think it has better storytelling than pretty much any other Warhammer 40k game out there. I do need to put Inquisitor Martyr as a, an honorary mention, because there is certainly a story to that. It does, however, get lost in the weeds. Um, I, the story stops becoming the main focus of the gameplay, and the gameplay devolves into grinding well before you get to see the conclusion to that story. At least it did when I played it, and that was a couple of years ago. So forgive me if it's been patched and improved since then. Nevertheless, I think that you know, with, with this and, and with what we're talking about, now let's look at the future of Warhammer 40k video games real fast and think about what it has to, to offer. So we have the Chaos Gate game coming out, which is basically Grey Knights versus Demons of Nurgle. At least Demons of Nurgle are the only ones I've seen. They've enlisted some serious talent into this game. Of course, Andy Serkis is playing the, the Grandmaster in this game. And you have writing that was done by Aaron Dembski Bowden. And I have a great deal of respect for Aaron as an author. Um, while I, I disagree with him on certain points, he and I actually had a, kind of a disagreement about the return of the custodies to the modern 40K universe. That was pretty interesting. This was a while ago. But uh, nevertheless, his prowess as a storyteller is, is something that I find to be not only am admirable, but something that I would I would aspire to. He has a, a real gift for writing. And while we may not agree on every single point, I never the nevertheless have a great deal of respect for him for taking some of the most difficult to write challenges in the 40k universe, such as the world eaters, such as the night lords, and turning them into fan favorite factions. Uh, particularly during the Horus Heresy, but not exclusively so. Uh, let's also not really forget his role in writing some of the, the great books of the Horus Heresy from a loyalist perspective. I mean, Master of Mankind was an incredible book, and it was very deep and complex. And I could, you know, I could spend a lot of time talking about a lot of the allegorical and, and symbolic meaning that's listed in that book. I mean... Just by having so many dream sequences, anytime there's a dream sequence, you know, they teach you this when you're going to school for, for literature, pay attention to all the dream sequences. It's usually more than just a, you know, hey, here's a cool place. Let's, let's look at this place. There's, there's always something more to it. But Aaron is writing for, for Chaos Gate, and I feel like there's a lot to hope for there. You know, they've They've certainly taken the time to invest into this game. So, Chaos Gate, there's one. Now, we have another 40k game coming out. I'm afraid that I'm... I believe it's called Dark Tide. But it's like the... Oh, gosh, what is it called? It's the Warhammer Fantasy one. There's... It's getting late and I'm starting to, to forget. 
uh, Vermintide. There it is. So Vermintide. So Warhammer Vermintide was uh, an excellent sort of um, Left for Dead style, uh, four player, up to four player, uh, you know, players versus the mob kind of a thing. And it had a very loose storytelling style where interactions between certain playable characters made for interesting like tidbits of lore. You would learn things about them as you played, but it was done in a you know, hands-off kind of a fashion. The focus was certainly on the heroes versus horde style of gameplay, and it feels like Dark Tide is going to do that exact same thing. I don't expect Dark Tide to make a whole lot of waves in terms of story. However, maybe I'll be wrong. And that one I think will be just pure catharsis, and I'm I'm not hating on it for for not having a a story element to it. But I do hope. You know, you know, we've talked about these games. There's some games coming out. I already mentioned Space Marine 2. There's more projects on the horizon. There's apparently a AAA game going way down the pipeline. I have no idea when that's going to be out. You know, a lot of people are hoping that it's being done by a studio like BioWare or something like that who made the, you know, the Dragon Age and the Mass Effect games, which had such great writing and which had such complexity and depth to the storytelling that made them you know, standout series for fans. I, I hope that something like that will someday be true for Warhammer. I hope that there will, there will come a game in Warhammer's future where they take the gloves off and they're ready to engage seriously with the material, not in the sense of, all right, well, we need to introduce new people into it, so we can't say too much. We're not going to go too much into detail. No, I want you to get messy. I want you to, to treat me like I can handle it as a consumer. And I want you to trust that if you put the work in, that you will be rewarded. Um, I don't think that b being dishonest about feedback on the story elements of certain games like uh, Battle Sector is going to serve that purpose. I think that they can do better. And again, story-wise, Battle Sector... It, it probably still gets like a B minus. It's not a terrible story. It just doesn't stay the course. But I want to see more A pluses. So that's where I'm going to end this segment. I appreciate you listening to me on this hour and a half long rant about storytelling in video games. I'm very interested in hearing what you have to say. If you've played Battle Sector and you played through the story, do you think that my assessment was wrong? I'd love to engage with you on that. Write it in the comments. Send me some feedback on my Facebook page, facebook.com slash brothercaptainmorgan. If you have a, a game that I haven't talked about that you think the storytelling should be called out, I would love to hear that too. I would be something I'd be interested in, in checking out. Please uh, let me know what that is in the comments or send me a message at my Facebook page. But either way, I hope this has been entertaining. Uh, I hope it's been elucidating. And I look forward to seeing you next time in the Librarius. discussion. So I will make this outro very brief for all of you with uh, the exceeding patience it would have taken to get through that whole thing. So far as goals, I'm going to keep trying to get the basement figured out, hoping I can get a chance to roll dice doing something in the next couple of weeks. And so far as the next episode goes, I think I will talk a little bit about 30k and the Dominion Zephon model and the idea of creating models with rules and Warhammer specifically related to some of these limited releases and the like the black library character models and things like that that have come out so i'll talk a little bit about you know eisenhorn we'll talk a little bit about gotrek we'll talk about zephon and fafnir and we'll talk a little bit about uriel ventress and i have a, a couple potential guests for the next episode i don't have anyone hammered out yet so i don't want to make an announcement and then have it be something else 
but expect something that I hope will be relatively entertaining. And with that, we'll close out the show. Thank you so very much for listening, and I will see you next time in the Librarius. Hey, you. Yes, you. Right there. You are listening to the Frontline Gaming Network. So what does that mean? That means that you have access to a bunch of different and interesting shows. Right now, I'm listening to a lot of Signals from the Frontline because who has time nowadays to follow on your own and get all of the latest news in the gaming hobby? It is streamed every Wednesday, and I never catch it for the stream, but I do catch it later. I especially enjoy Kicker's commentary. He is 40k hype man USA, and I challenge anyone, I dare you, to try and prove me wrong or to upstage the hype that is Kicker Kalazdi. So, with my recommendation in hand, go and listen to Signals from the Frontline on the Frontline Gaming Network. I am Chris Morgan, and you are listening to a Creative Commons licensed podcast. Some rights reserved.